Hello, hello. Uh, welcome to part uh, part twenty seven, I think, um, on uh, Friday the thirteenth, an auspicious <laughs> an auspicious date uh, for part twenty seven of this. Uh, this being uh, me writing a WebAssembly interpreter in Ruby. Um, I'm doing this to have fun. I'm doing it to demystify WebAssembly for myself, maybe for you. Um, and I'm doing it to just share how I work on stuff so that you can watch me hacking away at the same thing somewhat relentlessly with no end in sight. So, um, I'm, believe it or not, doing this mainly to have fun. That's more important to me than making a fully functional uh, WebAssembly implementation. Um, I want the code I write to be correct, even if it's not particularly fast. I want the code I write to be clear, even if it's not particularly clever. Um, I'm doing it all in pure Ruby, which I'm enjoying. I'm doing it with no dependencies, which I'm enjoying. That's the deal. Uh, let's have a quick retro on last time before I, um, before I get stuck in and start writing some code. Um, so last time I went into the previous session kind of fully intending to, well, to start work on a new language feature, basically. Um, but <laughs> unfortunately, a couple of notes that I had left for myself uh, in the gap between the session before that and that session um, ended up sort of nerd sniping me into working on branches and blocks again for several hours. Um, so that's a bit of a shame, but I'm really happy with how it turned out. Um, now we're using the unique tag objects generated by the catch method um, to directly jump to the target block. Um, so for each branch, we know what block it's targeting and we have a unique object to identify it uh, instead of relying on a sort of a, an integer index payload that gets decremented and rethrown until it hits zero, which was kind of a bit of a hack. Um, ah, hi, welcome. Thank you for, <laughs> thank you for coming along. Um, I'm, I'm also pleased that we finally got rid of that cursed uh, Boolean redo on branch keyword argument. Uh, to the as block method. And it was always kind of an unpleasant smell and I'm relieved to be shot of it. So yeah, overall, I think that was good. Hello, welcome Marco, hi. Um, I am 40% sad that we lost the uh, redo in as block because that was a good innovation from Chris Zetta for which I was grateful, but I'm also kind of 60% glad that we've ended up decoupling the sort of loop. The looping logic is now decoupled from the sort of the block body logic stack unwinding stuff and, and sort of uh, the catch and throw stuff. Um, so those two things are separated out now in a nice tidy way. I got rid of the Boolean argument. I think it is better overall. I just hope that, I hope that Chris agrees. Um, so like I said, I sort of ended up working on that for uh, a few hours. But after that, I did move on to fixing up some bugs and oversights with the memory implementation in the interpreter. And it turned out, yeah, I mean, so this is the worst part. One of the problems I had with the memory implementation is that it turned out I got the page size wrong by one byte, which was sort of embarrassing. Um, like with a normal commit history, you can only sort of investigate the circumstances of an embarrassing mistake from the past by sort of going back and reading what you put in the commit message, which usually isn't going to be enough to illuminate the problem. Because if you'd known you'd made a mistake at the time, you wouldn't have made that mistake. Um, so usually that old commit message is at best unhelpful. Um, but the good thing about this project, or potentially the terrible thing about this project, is that I can go back and watch myself make the mistake live on video, which is amazing slash awful. So I did go back and I checked the I checked the surveillance footage. Um, I added the page size in part eleven, which was back in October sometime last year. And I suppose fortunately, it turned out it was just a typo. I read the number six five five three six from the spec. But 
then I typed 65535 into IRB when I was converting the decimal number into, into hex. So it's sort of annoying that I can't type and that I made that silly error, but at least that error didn't spring from any sort of fundamental misunderstanding of what was going on. And also I'm glad, you know, part of the philosophy of this, I suppose, is that it doesn't really matter if I make errors because I've got all of these tests as a, you know, they're going to catch me and they're going to tell me that I've got it wrong. And that did eventually happen. It's just that it took from, you know, a mistake in part 11 didn't actually cause a test failure until part 26. So it would have been nicer if the, if the cause and effect had been closer together in time, but oh well, I fixed it eventually. Um, so anyway, I also fixed the, um, the store instruction to actually pay attention to the storage size and that just worked. Um, I made memory.grow respect the maximum memory size and that works okay. Um, and one way or another that made, I think five more test files pass. So it was a left or right dot west, memory size, memory grow, address and align. So that's five more tests that are passing. I'll take that. I feel good about that. That definitely feels like progress. Um, so I guess that's the good part, but like, you know, while it was good to get some more tests passing, I still feel like I haven't really done any new stuff for a while. Like I've just been fixing bugs in stuff I've already implemented and refactoring stuff I've already implemented. So I have this, I sort of need to implement some new language features. Like I have to focus on all of the features of WebAssembly if I'm ever going to stand a chance of actually running real programs, which would sort of be a nice thing to be able to do, right? To actually find something that had been compiled to WebAssembly and actually execute it. Um, so I think for this session, I'm going to hard resist the temptation to do any refactoring. And I'm just going to try and dig into implementing something new, as much new stuff as possible, so that I can flesh out my understanding of the rest of the language. You know, there's still too much stuff in WebAssembly that feels a bit mysterious to me and I haven't touched it. Um, and I don't want to keep shying away from that stuff. I'd like to actually sort of confront it head on. So yeah, I think for this session, I'm going to try and get stuck in some new tests, get some unfamiliar stuff passing, and hopefully I can sort of force myself to understand parts of WebAssembly that I haven't thought about yet. And that's really part of the point of this, um, this whole project. So let me press the correct set of buttons. This is slick, isn't it? There we go. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, where are we? Um, the tests are all still passing, it looks like. So that's good. Um, so I haven't, uh, I haven't updated my notes since last time. So this is all just leftovers from before. So this is me complaining about the spec. Uh, so this was specifically the thing about the identifier context reaching uh, function bodies. This was the thing about shadowing labels. I mean, I don't know that I'm ever, I think maybe I should move these because they're not things I could do next, maybe. These are like, you know, waiting for someone else. So these are sort of, um, I'll just put blocked. Um, Cause there's really nothing I can do about these until someone else does something. Um, so there's a few bits and pieces up here. Uh, yeah, I think a lot of this is in the category of just little bits of refactoring that aren't very important. I mean, that the most appealing thing is this one that says implement the spec test module and make it possible to import EG globals because there's a test that needs that. So this is this whole idea of making imports work is perhaps a good example of like something new, something that I haven't really thought about at all yet and haven't even tried to implement. It might be interesting to have a look at that this time. I think I've got some tests here, global names, function pointers. I mean, let's just try running um, global. 
Uh, yeah, this is just failing to parse import. Let's have a look if I just open a web browser. Um, GitHub assembly spec uh, global. So yeah, this, I just don't have any notion of this at the moment. Um, so I think I've, I think I've gone through this before on the, on the stream, but just to refresh both of our memories. So it says when running scripts, so give, you know, given that these test scripts that I'm running are sort of an extension of WebAssembly syntax, so you can't just define modules like in normal WebAssembly, you can also do all this other stuff like you can have, um, you know, the most important thing for my purposes is you can have assertions, but there's all this, this other stuff, you know, I'm gonna have to deal with all of this at some point because some of the tests use those things. But one of the things that the tests use is this spec test module that has some sort of predefined stuff inside it. So I haven't really thought at all about how imports work, but just sort of naively, it looks like the deal is that when you define a module, you can identify, you know, certain symbols that get exported and they can refer to, well, on the basis of this, they can refer to globals they can refer to tables, they can refer to memories, and they can re re refer to functions. Now, in the tests that we've been looking at, um, let me open this in a new window. So if I just go to, you know, Flow Expert or some other kind of old friend, um, these all use exporting just to make functions visible outside of the module, because I think I think you can you can give a function an identifier, um, but you can only refer to that within the same module. Uh, oh, there's no there's no function calls in there. Um, oh, I, how am I going to find a good example of this? Um, anyway, the the point I'm trying to make is that I think there's a I think there's sort of a distinction between, yeah, so you can see you can, this is the normal naming situation where you can just give an optional identifier to a function. And then within the same module, if you want to call one of these, for example, you can just call it by using its identifier. But there's a slight, slightly separate notion of, of it, the exported name of a function. And that makes it visible at least in the context of test scripts, that makes it visible outside of the module. So once we get into the assertions down here, we're not inside the module anymore. And then we can say invoke and refer to the sort of exported name of a function. And so there's this idea that you can, that we have this in a test environment, we have this predefined spec test module that contains, well, for example, it contains some globals called global i32, global i64, global f32, global f64. And they, they kind of, I mean, although they're called globals, I suppose we think of them as being like they're global to the module, I suppose. So these are effectively reserving storage within this specific spec test module and anyone who imports this module can then refer to these globals and it sort of looks like I'm not 100% sure what the deal is here because it's not giving these an identifier so whether these would just be referred to by their index or if they would maybe not Maybe you can just refer to global i32. Um, uh, yeah, I'm not really sure how this works. I mean, looking through this file, there's a heck of a lot of assertions that I don't support. Um, I'm not sure who tries to refer to this. Um, but I also, I don't know if they refer to it by name. Um, 
you know, these functions down here are just referring to the globals A, B, R. So I'm not quite sure how the imported globals are supposed to work, but clearly the general idea is that a module should be able to import any of these and use them. And specifically, all of these print functions are ones that are actually able to... So these are... I'm not sure what the right word is, but I would call these sort of native functions. The idea is that the test environment provides all these functions and then the tests can call them to print stuff out to standard output. So this is something that I don't have support for at the moment. You know, the notion of a function that isn't implemented in WebAssembly, but is sort of natively implemented and then just sort of exported from a kind of a built-in module like this. So I haven't really thought about how to do any of this. Um, Maybe I should just give it a go. I'm just going to quickly survey, like, well, there are two things that I need to do here, right? One of them is to implement this spec test module in some way. So have a module that already exists that contains these globals exported under these names and a table and a memory and some functions exported under the correct names. That's one job. Maybe I'll just make a maybe I'll just make a list of that. So yeah, it's like implement the spec test module uh, with all the necessary globals, table, memory, and functions exported under the correct names. Maybe I'll put this underneath this because these are really sort of subtasks. Um, but also there's like implement importing <laughs> and maybe I could do this first actually like is there just an import test yeah because perhaps I could perhaps this is more self-contained like oh, this is register register test oh and this 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 depends on importing stuff from spec test as well um so th this ain't it like this isn't gonna this isn't a test that is gonna allow me to focus on implementing just import without also thinking about implementing spec test so it was worth a try but maybe this kind of thing is my best bet particularly since i can't really see what effect if any these have uh, yeah, let's have a look at let's have a look at other ones that I've listed as needing import spec test. So there's names um, dot last. Uh, what does this try to import? So this imports print i32. I'm not quite sure what's going on here. Test that we can use indices instead of names to reference imports. Yeah, I'm not sure I understand what's going on here. Um, but that looks... Oh, it's just not going to parse it, presumably. Yeah, so in all these cases, the parser is just blowing up. So maybe it might be interesting to see how many of these things that are importing functions are actually going to use them. Although here I can see this says export print32 func2. Okay, yeah, there's something sort of interesting going on here. Yeah, this would suggest to me that when you import another function, you can only refer to it by its index, but maybe that's not true. Um, okay. Uh, what else? Uh, function pointers. I mean, that sounds a little bit frightening. Okay. 
Okay, so yeah, this uh, this one's only inside an insert invalid. Oh no, except this this one at the top. Import spec test print print i thirty two. So yeah, I mean this this kind of makes more sense to me that you can. This is like a normal function definition that gives it a local identifier within the module, and then instead of a body, it's got an import here that is presumably saying, I want to bring in the implementation of this function from outside. Um, I mean, realistically, do I want the test to be able to print stuff out? Like, not especially, but I suppose I can... The test isn't going to know whether I implement this to actually print anything out or not, but it might be kind of cool to have it print stuff out because then I can see what it does. Um, okay, so um, maybe this is maybe this is the easiest place to start then. At the very least, I'm going to be able to I'm going to have to be able to parse some of these things. So maybe these, yeah, I mean, I think I'm going to pick on this. So let's start by um, adding these to my pending tests so that I remember that I'm trying to work on them. So this is global names, func pointers. I mean, am I going to regret this func pointers thing? I think this is mostly stuff that I should be able to. This all I think the I think this list of things here is related to things that we've already implemented and therefore might work. So there's nothing too frightening in here. I think I just need to need to figure it out. So that can be my kind of my work in progress set. Um, now I've just got to try and figure out how to approach this. So I mean. Yeah, so I'll try running just that global dot wast in in isolation, and the parser is just completely failing to parse this. So let's take a look and see. I mean, for now, I'll just take a look and uh, uh, well, I can see how it's supposed to look. So I can just go to the parser and try and make it support that. Um, Okay, pending test failed successfully. So that's all good. I mean, it'd be nice if I could get to a place where it would be nice if these parsing errors went away. So maybe that's what I'll do first is like deal with the parsing errors and then move on to the assertion failures, which I'm expecting to see. So let's say add global.wast, names.wast, and func pointers.wast to pending tests. Um, these are all currently failing because the parser doesn't know how to deal with import. So I'm hoping that if I fix the parser, I will at least start seeing assertion failures rather than parse failures. Okay. So this is presumably there's a parse global. So currently, I parse the string global, and then this is like read an optional identifier, which isn't present. And then it says read list starting with mutt. So um, where can I see an example of that? Uh, What would it look like? Global mutt. Uh, is it like that? Yes. Okay, so some of these are already passing. So yeah, I shouldn't have closed that. Um, I shouldn't have closed that file I had open. Uh, interpreter. 
uh, spec test. So I, I don't really know what this means. Um, I mean, I'm, I assume it's something to do with it being mutable. Um, you can see here it doesn't specify that it's mutable, but I don't know if this is important or meaningful. We certainly have a lot of places where, let's just look for all the globals. Um, so, yeah, I mean, a lot of them do say mutt. Um, but there also seem to be plenty that don't. So I'm not entirely sure what the deal is there. Um, this doesn't specify what the value of the global is. So, uh, you know, I don't know if that defaults to zero or whatever. Um, so I suppose for now, I will just, well, how about I actually uh, look at the syntax so that I know, you know, what I want to know is basically does what and what I was hoping to see by looking at these files, which I can't really see, is whether if you're exporting something, um, does that come before or after the mutt? Or are they, you know, are they mutually exclusive in some way? I can't see a place. Yeah, so this is import mutt. Um, oh yeah, here we go. Global export a mutt f32. Okay, well that's good enough for me for now. Um, and again, can I, do I have any clue of where the identifier goes? The identifier goes immediately after global. So it's global keyword optional identifier um, uh, export and then mutt so let's say read list well so this is going to be if can read list starting with export to do and then I can see that for Oh, actually, I'm more worried about importing here, aren't I? Sorry. Sorry, uh, what I was doing here was nonsense. Uh, yeah, global identifier import mutt i32. Um, I can see that by looking at this that there's loads of different forms that globals show up in and I guess that's because there's multiple abbreviations at work here but I just haven't thought about this at all yet so I think I'm going to have to dig into this um, so in here there's going to be well let's just do this so like that is to do uh, as is this because this is just more of the same So now this is going to allow us to skip over this import thing because this is just going to repeatedly read until it's eaten everything inside here. So I'd be interested to see just with this change um, and making the mutt section optional. I don't think it's going to be able to parse this type. Because the expectation here is that now there's going to be some instructions that tell you what the initial value of that global is supposed to be. And here, there isn't. It's just a type. Um, I just realized down here we've got this extern ref as well. So there's, I was sort of wrong here. This doesn't just need import spec test. It needs extern ref. 
uh, ref.null funk ref so there's actually although it was this was what was immediately tripping it up I can see there's more stuff down here so let's just see what happens uh, when I run this Yes, unhandled exception. So I think this is complaining about the fact that there's something unread at the end here. It wasn't able to find an expression. There's just this type sitting here. So maybe now I, I do need to have a look at what the what the syntax of globals is supposed to be. Um, Uh, text format, I guess this will be in modules, globals. Uh, so this is the basic syntax, global, ID, optional, global type, expression. So there's going to be abbreviations that involve imports. Yeah, here we go. Globals can be defined as imports or exports in line. So... Well, firstly, let's just understand this, because I've got the global part and I've got the ID part. Uh, I'm not entirely sure what the global type bit is. I mean, maybe this sort of, mu you know, saying that something is a mutable I-32, you know, maybe this is the alternative to that. So I need to be able to, I need to force, you know, if this is mandatory, then I can have this sort of optional import here, but then I have to force the reading of a type. And if it, if and there needs to be like an else clause here, that's like else, you know, to do read non mut type, something like that. And then this is just optional um, because the instructions aren't necessarily there, but I think that's probably okay. Parse instructions. Uh, repeatedly do yeah this is gonna if there's nothing to read this is gonna be happy it's just gonna not run at all so I think I think this I think that effectively makes the instructions already optional because it's fine if they're not there um, but I do have to deal with this type. So let's see how this is supposed to work. Yeah, because this E expression here um, can be zero, zero instructions. So yeah, how does global type work? Global types, so it's either a value type or it's this mutt. So yeah, it doesn't look like this is optional so the ID is optional, but we can tell syntactically whether there is an ID there because ID just has to begin with. Ah, oh, has to begin with a dollar. So it's easy to see whether that's there. So we will read the ID if we can just ignoring the import abbreviation. So I think here, yeah, this is there's going to have to be a thing that's like, if you can read this starting with mutt, then do. Else, we're just reading the type. So it has to be one or the other. Okay, what's this complaining about now? How far have we got? Uh, it's saying it still hasn't read the, still hasn't read the whole contents of the list. Um, let's just say. Where is it actually having this problem? Uh, 
Oh. Parsing, global import spec test, global I32, I32. So what's the problem there? Oh, hold on. This needs to be repeatedly read. I just didn't think about that because there are multiple things inside the, after we've read import, read would read one of these things, but actually we need to read multiple of them. I'm sure it's more subtle than that, but for now I'm just trying to brute force it to get it through the parser. Um, yeah, okay, so now it's complaining about something else, ref.null. So that's down here. So this is, I think, a step in the right direction. Um, this is allowing it to sort of read that import, or at least parse it, and completely ignore it. And here, this allows it to read and completely ignore the type. Um, maybe that's worth adding. Um, I'm just trying to decide whether that's two separate changes. Maybe it is. Uh, no. So here, if I just... move this here. Uh, is that okay? And then the diff is, yeah, replacing that with, okay, yeah, all right. So I'm gonna say um, support um, import well, let's say a support parsing import abbreviation in parse global. Um, we're completely ignoring it for now, but at least we can parse it successfully. And then this is uh, support parsing. Uh, what is it, val type? Uh, that's var. Global types classify global variables which hold a value and can be either mutable or immutable. I still don't really know what the meaning of this is. Well, I suppose what I mean is, I don't know if if you just put a value type, does that mean that it's immutable? Because, um, uh, you know, maybe what I need to say here is like, immutable global types. I can I can just make, make a link to this, if nothing else. Um, Let's just say support parsing. Uh, support parsing value type as global type in parse global. Um, I'm not sure what this means uh, semantically. So I'm not yet sure what this means semantically. Uh, e.g. does it imply that the global is immutable, but it's legitimate to use a bare value type, e.g. i32, instead of e.g. mut i32 when declaring a global. 
so we need to be able to parse it. Okay, so that's made a little bit of progress. Um, oh, but unfortunately, I've got other problems. So I suppose I have to make a decision here about am I just gonna am I just gonna commit to the bit and try and get basically try and get global dot west parse, parsing and parsing. <laughs> um, is that what I want to prioritize? I mean, I guess I should just get on with it. Like, hopefully none of these global variable things are going to be particularly difficult to deal with. I mean, I, I'm nervous about this extern ref. I mean, I don't know how I'm managing to parse that. Oh, I suppose it's being ignored as a, as some kind of type. Um, yes, because extern ref is a apparently a ref type. Um, so that's one of the types that I'm currently ignoring. Uh, so that's just being happily thrown away, but. It does not know what to do with ref.null. So I think I'm just going to, I think I'm just going to get on with it and try and get this working, see how much of it I can, see if I can bottom out these parser errors <laughs> and get to the point where I'm at least successfully parsing this file. Because, I mean, well, the reason why this was on my list in the first place is that there's a lot of stuff in here that should already work. Um, but obviously I just don't really know what things like this mean. Um, so what's this ref.null? And maybe I should also think about the import and export stuff. So where there's an import, it's name one and name two. So I don't know what that is. Presumably one of them is the the name of the module and the other one is the name of the the identifier that you're importing from the module. I don't know. This doesn't say. I mean, this is just about syntax, so that's fine. Um, presumably if I look at the import syntax, it will tell me what... Oh, yeah, module name... And then this is the imported name. Okay, fair enough. Um, so yeah, w when you get this, this essentially expands to being a global, uh, sorry, an import command. And when it's an export, it expands to being an export command. So I haven't really, haven't really thought about these top level import and exports. I'm just thinking about the, the abbreviated form for the moment. Um, so what does this mean? This is, again, this is essentially a type. But instead of saying i32 or i64, it's saying it's, I assume this is an external reference. I don't really know what that means. Um, so is this an expression? It looks very much like one. Like, we just haven't thought about references at all, but it seems like... In all these cases, we have an expression that's like the 32-bit integer minus 12. And here we're saying ref.null extern. So maybe I need to, for the purposes of this, I need to support that expression. Reference instructions, like haven't thought about this at all. Um, which doesn't bode particularly well for this, does it? Like, maybe I should have looked at... Is there some kind of references? Ref funk. Is that, is that the best you got? Ref funk, ref is null, ref null. OK, 
okay. All right, well, maybe I... Maybe I just need to understand what how refs work. What does ref funk do? So yeah, this is using register, which I don't understand. This is using import. So it it feels like we're getting into a sort of almost like a strongly connected set of ideas here, where it's like this whole notion of having globals that can be imported. Um, seems to be related to having function references somehow. I mean, maybe I could just understand this if I read this. Um, here's a module that exports a function f. Oh, so I guess register m is saying that's the name of this module. And then here, so you can sort of inline say the previous module is registered under the name m. And then this is saying, I want to import the function f that was exported from the module that I gave the name M. But then how does this funcref stuff work? Global funcref ref.func dollar f. So this is like a global that contains like a function pointer. Is that what is that the idea of ref.func? Is that it sort of somehow contains the the address or otherwise identifies this function? Uh, yeah, I can't. Uh, well, it's not that I can't. It's that I can't be bothered to go any further with this file because I, I just don't want to get into it. I want to try and stay focused on just getting this parsed. So I guess I don't really need to care about what it means. Um, okay. What's ref.null extern? Uh, ref.null heap type. Okay. So this is a kind of instruction that I haven't dealt with before, but obviously I need to be able to I need to be able to deal with it, don't I? Um, okay. I don't think I'm going to have to Pars folded plane instruction, is that just going to delegate to... Yeah, okay. I'm just sort of remembering how all of this folded stuff works, but I think it's all just going to be in Pars normal instruction. Um, so yeah, I just need to add it in here. And I suppose I might as well do it at the bottom. So this is going to be in ref.null. Uh... So what do I have to do? Has the opcode already been read? Yeah, okay. So I've already read it. And now I just have to read the type and ignore it for now. And then I guess I'm going to have to return some new AST node. Don't know what any of this means, but hopefully it's going to be complaining about something else now. Right, ref.extern. Where's that? Oh, that's quite a long way further down. Okay, only two occurrences of that. But this is a similar situation. Um, do I already have a place that's dealing with these sort of things that take a single argument? Uh, so these are all of the things that take no argument. think. Um, these are all the things that take an index. And then I think maybe everything else is sort of custom. So I guess I, I guess I'll just do the same thing here. Um, so 
So do we get a ref.extern in here? Why is that not mentioned? Am I misunderstanding what this is? Oh, okay. So this is special assertion syntax, isn't it? Uh, just saw this a minute ago. Host reference. What does that mean? Um, I mean, who knows? <laughs> who knows what that means? But I need to be able to parse it. Uh, so let's just think about all I care about at this stage is what's the syntax. It's just followed by a number. That's the extent that I care about it for now. Oh, come on. Export. So where is it complaining about this? Inside read list. Oh, well, it's uh, from. So let's see what it's trying to do. Reading list from export A global zero. So it's here, I guess. Right, okay, so this is, this is what I was talking about, I suppose, is that now we're having to deal with, this is just an expression. Is it? No. It's a sort of top level in a module. Um, you can have this at the top of a module and I think I just don't support this yet. So that's another thing we need to support is top level exports inside a module. So that's going to be in parse text fields. Um, what was the complaint? Yeah, so this is inside parse text fields. Oh, actually, it's inside build initial context. Um, so yeah, I need to think about that because it's that this is a new case that can appear inside here. So this is when we are building the initial identifier context. Uh, Uh, where's the section that explains the initial identifier context? So here, that's a, this is essentially this function here where we're, we, we look over the fields in the, in the module definition and populate the identifier context with it. It doesn't look like exports have any effect on that. So here it's saying if there's anything else it shouldn't contribute anything. So I think in here, obviously I could have an else here that says context.new, but I think what I'd like to do is keep it explicit. Um, not global, export. 
So what's the syntax that I need to support here in order to be able to skip over this successfully? It's like export and then a name and then a description of the thing to export. Export, name, thing being exported. Um, so le let's just repeatedly read because I'm just going to ignore it for now. So now, yeah, now we're directly inside parse text fields, which is what I was anticipating. Um, so let's just say in export. Uh, can I just repeatedly read at this point? Like I'm just trying to get the parser happy. Okay, so now there's another problem. Is it here that the problem is, this mutt? It shouldn't be. I think I can support that. Um, let's say uh, parsing instruction S expression, quicker to type it. So what's going on? Uh, global export a mutt F32. So is this some... I guess this is syntax that I don't support in parse global yet. Module global export A my f32 f32 const zero um i'm not sure exactly what's happening here I mean, my debugging is not very good, so it's not that surprising. Parsing instruction from const1, const0. Parsing instruction from mut f32. So. Where is this happening? Oh, it's such a deep stack trace. Um, parse text fields, parse global, parse instructions. So I think it's trying to parse this global. So let's say so it's during this, it's trying to parse this as the instructions, but that's not right. It should be this as the instructions. Oh, right. Okay. We don't support the export abbreviation. I've forgotten that. I've forgotten we've only done import. Uh, right, and I was sort of bamboozled by this because this looks superficially similar, but this is actually not part of the global declaration here, whereas here there's an export that's embedded inside the global declaration. So we need to have at least cursory support for 
that abbreviation. So here in the same way that we support import, there's a sort of else if can read list starting with export. So what do we do here? So it's saying that this is an abbreviation for export under this name, whatever that identifier is, and then you just, and then you sort of, effectively you strip the export out here and then whatever came after it still comes after it in the global definition. So that, I think that means from, from this, from the point of view of the parser at this point, I think I can, I can just ignore it again. So I think that's going to fix that problem. Um, uh, now I've got another problem. Import. <laughs> oh dear, this doesn't feel very... I find it very hard to tell whether I'm making progress here. Um, I thought this was... I thought it was going to be easy to just knock this on the head and get the, get the parser to successfully parse it, and then I could actually start thinking, but this is turning out to be more painful than I was expecting. Um, so this is inside build initial context. Okay, so what's it doing? Inside build initial context, import, no matching pattern error. So, yeah. Similar situation. Uh, modules. Right. So this is a bit painful because we actually do need to pay attention to what's inside this import. But I think for now, I'm just going to skip it in the desperate hope that that's going to cause the parser to succeed. No, nope, still not. Okay, so now we also need to support it in import text fields. Sorry, parse text fields. In import, repeatedly, read. Okay. Okay. That was a bit of a struggle, but I'm now at least at the point where it's successfully parsed it, ignored all the stuff that we needed, and then um, evaluation is failing for some reason. But that's at least something that I can now start debugging and figuring out what semantics I need to implement to make that work. So uh, where did we get to with all of that? Let me get rid of all of this parser debugging stuff. Uh, okay. It's a bit weird that that was separated given that it's not actually doing anything useful yet. Uh, So hold on, let me just make sure I haven't misunderstood how these reference instructions look. Because this syntax is all about things that take immediate instruction, uh, immediate arguments, right? So if there's a call, right, that takes an index, for example. Um, so I think it's legitimate. Now this ref, well, I haven't done ref.func yet, but that does take an index, but ref.null takes this other thing, this heap type. 
Funk or Extern. Okay, so I'm I'm just thinking about how I'm gonna add this. Um So that's the AST node for it. Where did I parse that? In there. So I mean, arguably I should have added these as I was going, but I, I didn't really know what I was doing and I still don't know what I'm doing, but I now feel like I've, I've got to a stable stopping point. So it's time for me to uh, clear the decks and get all this stuff committed and then see where I can go from there. So, and this like support parsing the ref.null instruction. Yeah, I think that would be fine. Um, and then I can do the same for a ref extern. Um, and then So this is specifically about the abbreviation, and this is about yes. Okay, so I think I think these two changes go together essentially. You know, supporting export at the top level, uh, support parsing, export. Uh, well, so support parsing the export module field. Um, let's just say at the moment the parser is ignoring everything about this. And then I can do the same for import. So again, the parser is currently ignoring everything about this. And so then we're just left with this, so support parsing. Uh, well, what did I say? Because I literally just did this. So this is um support parsing export abbreviation in parse global. Again, ignored for now. Okay, so now the parser at least manages to succeed in reading this file, but obviously success is short-lived because it doesn't seem to be able to have a single assertion pass. Evaluate script length mismatch, given zero, expected one. Okay, so what's what's the problem with that? It's managed to parse that module successfully, but I don't know if it... Well, let's see what this is trying to do. So somewhere inside here, 
Oh, okay. Yeah. So this is it. This is during, is it instantiation we called it? So this is where it's trying to initialize all of the, all of the globals. But this doesn't account for the fact that I think the expression is, well, it's not optional exactly, but it might not, might not push anything onto the stack. Um, so let's just say. This is the very first global. Presumably it's this one. <laughs> um, it doesn't have any value because it's an import. Um, so yeah, perhaps not surprising that that's not working. So while the export abbreviation here is essentially equivalent to doing this, it's equivalent to having a declaring a global that has an expression for its initial value, but it also synthesizes this export so that that global gets exported under a particular name. The import abbreviation is doesn't work the same way. Because actually, this doesn't have any expression. And I guess there isn't any notion that it gets initialized at all, because effectively, the global disappears as part of expanding this abbreviation. You know, where, when, you're ex when you're using the export abbreviation, the global continues to exist, and whatever is under the ellipsis here kind of gets preserved. But here, not so much. The global actually sort of goes away. Um, I mean, the, I suppose the elephant in the room is that I just don't have a good way to deal with, I don't have a general way to deal with abbreviations at the moment. At the moment, what I've been trying to do is just sort of handle them on an ad hoc basis. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. But there's a bit of a problem here because when I do... Uh, in the parser. When I do parse global, you know, the expectation is that this is going to return something, that it's going to return a global. Um, and in this case, I think if there's an import inside the global, then it doesn't return one really. It just returns an import. I mean, maybe that's okay. Um, and there's all sorts of nonsense going on here. This is suggesting to me that What's this init business? Oh, right, okay, yeah, okay. So this is just the AST node for a global variable that it's got a type and it's got this initializer, initialization expression, yeah, constant initializer expression. Um, it's type specifies whether global is immutable or mutable. Globals are references through global indices, starting with the smallest index, not referencing a global import, okay. Um, So yes, if it if it has an export abbreviation, then we do get a we do get a global out of it. If it's got an import, then we don't. What does this say? 
this export abbreviation can be applied repeatedly if dot 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 contains additional export clauses consequently a global declaration can contain any can contain any number of exports possibly followed by an import oh i see right so what it's saying here is that <laughs> you can say global dollar foo export bar dot 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 and that will synthesize an export with the name bar and then it will return to interpreting whatever else was after here but that could be export batters so you could have multiple exports here and then actually after the final export you could have one of these imports too so you can never have an initializer for this so um you're actually not guaranteed to get a global out of this because this abbreviation might terminate in an import so i have to think about how i want to do this uh and this very much raises the question of like what should parse global return because at the moment well looking at this it's clear to me that it can return either just a an ast node for a global which is currently what it's trying to do but it could also return an import of a global um like whatever parsing import does Uh, what is this imports right okay so yeah this is a this is an import record so again this is like an ast node for an import so at the moment without something more systematic to expand abbreviations before we try to parse them which maybe i should be thinking about um parsing a global can actually return one of these imports and i assume it can return an export well yeah of course it can um this is a similar thing. This is an export record. So, or an export AST node. So, yeah, how do I want to handle this? Maybe I just have to live with it. Maybe I just have to live with the fact that when you call parse globals, you don't just get globals back. And I think this is probably going to be true of a lot of things. I think I think a lot of the things in here have got abbreviations. Like, yeah. So for function definitions, it's the same deal. It can return import, you know, it can turn into an import which doesn't even have a a function body um or it can turn into an export which might eventually terminate in an import so this yeah same same message here so what's the right thing to do here I'm not quite sure. Um, I mean, I could just return an array of stuff for all of these, like rather than just guaranteeing that when you call parse global, you're going to get a global AST node back. It's just like you're going to get some stuff and that stuff is going to be limited to. There might be a global AST node in there, but there might be imports and exports as well um and maybe that's just the way it is i mean who calls pars global who's going to have to deal with this so this is not necessarily going to be correct anymore if i do that oh that's actually the only caller right because i'm not even trying to parse it <laughs> when I'm building the initial context down here. So for now, the caller here would just have to deal with the fact that parse global 
might return imports and exports in addition to globals. You know, it'd have to be, let me just think this through. I'm not sure this is the right way to think about it, but let's just say hypothetically, if this returned an array that might contain a global, uh, maybe, yeah, I mean, this is the easiest way to deal with it for right now is just to have this return an array, right? Uh, and then for the caller here, what we actually need to do is say parse global, you know, each do result, case result in global, you know, else to do, basically, you know, this... <laughs> There could also be imports and exports inside here. I mean, I don't feel great about that. But it feels like that's sort of what we have to do. And the, to deal with the syntax here, Well, I mean, for right now, I don't have any representations of imports and exports right now. I mean, I'm very, I'm quite aware that at the moment, and maybe this is a thing for me to go back and clean up, that's like, let's say, implement export. implement the func export abbreviation <laughs> in a more principled way which makes the export explicit uh, rather than hiding the exported name in the function AST node, because that's the problem I've got here is that ultimately you're not gonna be able to get away with this. Like right now in this function, it's just, it keeps track of it's a single exported name. So I don't really support this properly. I just support the limited syntax here where if you say export the once then it will be able to write an exported name into the function ast node but that's not really the way that this is supposed to work it's supposed to generate exports um and you can see it does it by Effectively, it's generating a fresh name for the function. So if the function here was... So how does this work? The function... Hold on. Yeah, this thing about fresh identifiers is probably important. So if you've got, if you've got a function here and you call it foo, this is saying that it doesn't call it foo. It makes up a new name for it. It's not the original ID, it's ID prime. So it's saying, oh no, hold on. It's saying ID prime is the original name of the function if you provided one. So if the, if the function name is not empty, then id prime is the original function name. But, okay, this makes sense. If the original function name was empty, it generates a new identifier for the function, right? So this id prime fresh is saying, this freshness condition is just being, is just gonna be about this id isn't used anywhere else. Um, 
and I'm not quite sure how we're going to achieve that. Um, where does fresh link to? Text ID fresh. Can't even see what that's linking to. Um, yeah, that's a mystery. Is there a good definition of freshness in here? Right. This may be any syntactically valid identifier that does not already occur in the given source text. So we need some kind of mechanism for generating fresh identifiers. That's a whole can of worms that I don't want to get into at this point. Um, so I wonder, do I need to... Do I need to park what I'm doing and, and make this work first? Maybe I do. Because I'm a little bit nervous that I'm not going to be able to get a decent grip on this problem. Yeah, I think I do want to. I think I want to... Let's just check all of the... I haven't... You know, that all of the tests are passing right now. But I'm sort of worried that I'm bumping up against a problem that I've ignored up until now, which is how am I going to implement abbreviations properly? And I've already been in situations like this where I've I should have been able to implement abbreviations and I just haven't or I've implemented them, I've hacked them without, but I haven't implemented this syntax correctly, so I haven't made it possible to, you know, to export a function more than once under different names. Um, okay, so that's all pending test fails successfully, that's what I wanted. Um, so let's just think about How that might work. I close some of this up because I'm not using it all at the moment. So there is this exports test, and I think that was on my list of things. Yeah, needs export. <laughs> so maybe I should think about this instead. Yeah, I think maybe this is what I'm talking about. I think maybe I do need to look at this and get this working properly. Um, although this has got all kinds of other stuff <laughs> that I don't know how to support yet. I don't know what get is. Um, is that part of... Is that part of this test script or is that a legit WebAssembly instruction? Action. Invoke get. Yeah, get global export. Okay, so that's n this is not a normal WebAssembly instruction. This is just a piece of test script that I would need to implement. But I think maybe I'm trying to run before I can walk without having this be operational. So this has got this is ex exactly what I'm talking about. Like. the ability to export a function under multiple names. Like, I just can't do this at the moment. Um, yeah, I can't even parse it. Yeah, 
export. Um, oh, it's funny. I, I, I assume it's this that's causing the problem. Oh, no, maybe it's... Mm, I don't know. Oh, no, it probably is this, isn't it? Because it's probably treating, or, you know, one of these, it's treating the export as if it's part of the function body because it doesn't know that you can have multiple exports here. So... Yeah, I think maybe I should try and approach this somehow. Not sure what to do about the fresh identifier situation. Um... But I'm going to have to deal with it. So let's let's switch it up a bit. And let's start looking at uh, exports. So I'm I'm making a bit of a <laughs> feels like I've uh, feels like my optimism has come back to bite me there because like I tried piling up these three things and started working on the parsing for this one but I don't think I'm even ready to to think about any of those really I just need to think about exports so let's say add exports dot last to pending tests um, and then I can just say uh, while looking at global dot last, I realize that I probably need to get a better grip on exports before I try to do or exports of already implemented things like eg functions before I start trying to make uh, uh, yeah, exported globals work. So I'm going to uh, pause the globals work and think about exports instead. Okay. So is this just functions? No, this is also exporting globals. So maybe this is going to shake out the... Maybe this is going to shake out what I need. How am I... No, see... I... Unfortunately, this has got all the table stuff in it as well. I mean, to, you know, fortunately, this says to do access table. It doesn't look like it's actually exercising it. Um, similarly, it's not actually exercising the memory. Hopefully, it's calling some of these functions. Yeah. So, I think luckily for me, oh, no, look, this is, this, well, okay. So, I'm going to have to get exports working for functions and globals to get this working. And then I'll bounce back and look at globals and try and figure out how I'm going to get the importing working here. But I, I just wasn't really ready to, to deal with this. Um, so. Oh, I'm just going to take a second to. Uh, commiserate with myself that this is turning out to be a little bit complicated. But this is essentially what I wanted. You know, I've, I'm conscious that I've been like rummaging around with <laughs> things that I've already implemented and like just tinkering with how blocks work and how branches are implemented and stuff like that. And I think this is what I sort of wanted was to force myself to push into stuff that I wasn't comfortable with yet, but it's just sort of a bit painful. 
to have to confront stuff that that I'm not really ready to deal with. But so let's think about it. I'm just jumping straight to saying, so let's think about it. <laughs> um, I think for now, you know, I do need a general approach to dealing with abbreviations in a situation like this. Like some of the abbreviations are sort of only, are just sort of, they only have an effect locally, by which I mean like, you know, you're parsing, oh, I can't think of a good example. Like that thing about when you're parsing a block type and it, there can be various different cases and there's a, there's a way of abbreviating them and stuff like that. And it's like, you still get a block type back, but you just have to parse it differently depending on what abbreviation is being used. But this is a little bit different because these abbreviations are saying that, well, in particular, when you parse a function that uses import, you don't even get a function definition back. You just get an import. Um, and oh, this is all quite annoying from the perspective of populating the initial identifier context, but I just can't see that there's anything I can do about that. Um, well, when I do this in a single pass, when I change it to work in a single pass, I don't think it's going to be such a pain, but right now there's going to be duplication of the work involved in dealing with the the exports, but that's okay. Let's just take it a step at a time and figure out how, how do I want to be able to support this? Um, because presumably in here, oh, the, the initial context doesn't care about exported names. It only cares about the IDs that appear in here. Okay. Yeah, that's not too bad. And when you do generate an identifier here, no one else can be referring to it. So it's only important from the perspective of tying this generated identifier to this export here. Um, okay. So, all right, let's just work through. I mean, really the, the indicator of whether I've done the job here is going to be whether I've been able to remove the exported name from the AST node for functions. You know, right now, if I remove the exported name, there's no way for any of these assertions to like call the correct function, basically. Um, so that's a problem. So maybe what I should do is fall back rather than worrying about a test that is not working. Maybe what I should do is fall back to a test that does work. So something simple like i32.wast. I think this is maybe the first one that I implemented. Um, oh, in literals was the first one I implemented, but this is a pretty simple one. Um, so this involves exporting a bunch of functions and then calling them. And, you know, this invoke is referring to the name that's being exported from this, from this module. So if I can keep this test passing, indeed all the tests passing, while removing the exported name from here, then I will have got somewhere because that will require me to separate out the notion of an export. Um, So what's an export? An export is a mapping of a name 
to an export description, which can be one of a function, a table, a memory, or a global. Okay. So I'm not quite sure how I'm going to implement that in the AST. I think I'm just going to need a, some sort of enumeration that lets me specify, because it's really just an ID. You know, I need like a sort of a kind, you know, what what flavor of ID is it? Um, okay. All right, I need to start sketching this out because I'm sort of beating around the bush here. So what I was talking about before So in build initial context, it's just retrieving the function name. So that's okay. Sorry, I've gone all quiet. Um, let's just think about parse function. So this has got some sort of a special case here that says that's got parse export. And I think this is the only place that's calling that at the moment. So what I need to do here is well, let's just think about exports for now. I am going to have to support imports later, but let's just think about exports. So what we need to be able to do here is generate potentially, we need to be able to parse and generate potentially many exports. Like it's not good enough to just say parse export here. This needs to be something like, um, while can read list starting with export. Something like that. Uh, and I guess this, I mean, really this parse export is not really doing anything. So that's not going to break anything. That's just going to allow us to read multiple of these. Um, but at the moment, we're not doing anything with them. Uh, so let's, I think I can commit that. Yeah, I'll say support reading multiple export abbreviations uh, in parse function. Um, there can be arbitrarily many of these, so we need to be able to read all of them, not just one. I've inlined uh, parse export because it doesn't do the right thing anymore and it's only called in this one place anyway. So for now it's clearer to have the logic in line. Okay. Um, so that at least makes it possible for me to read multiple of these. Um, but what is going on here is that we need to... For each export that we read, 
we need to synthesize one of these function exports. And yeah, I suppose, you know, the reason why I'm hesitating about this is that we need to be prepared psychologically for the coming of this, because once once we support the import abbreviation, there won't even be a function here anymore. It'll just be an import. So we won't have syntactically any of this business. Like all of everything that makes this a function definition is like the list of locals, the body, the type information. But if it's an import, it just doesn't have any of that. I mean, it's got a type use. but it doesn't have the other syntactic qualities of a function definition. So we need to be able to sort of bail out. I think at this point, I don't want to be in a situation where I'm creating an, an AST node for a function definition because there isn't one. Like it, it looks like it's going to be a function definition, but once you've used the import abbreviation, it's not really a function definition anymore, it's just an import. So I think what I want to be able to do is have this situation where we're returning like an array that contains a function definition. And then in the case where it's an import, we just wanna be able to not return a function definition because there isn't one anymore. Um, So let's make that change as well. So let's make this, this parse function returns an array and this becomes whatever it was I did here, you know, parse function each do um, result. I mean, for now, I'm just gonna do this I'm just gonna do a type check on them to decide what to do with them. So case result in function, oops. And there's gonna be a sort of, well, I suppose for now we don't really need the we don't need the else there. It's gonna work fine because that's the only thing you can get back from calling parse function. But this is making space for me being able to say in here, like in export, you know, exports gets the result. Um, so let's say return array from parse function. Well, and let's say um, this is preparing for the ability of parse function to return potentially many exports and perhaps an import instead of a function definition depending upon which abbreviations are used. So let's just link to this. Okay, so it's all still okay, but we're nibbling away at this problem of what should parse function actually return. So now that we've done this, I think what I'd like to do is something like uh, empty array tap do results.
and then this can be results you know we add a function definition to the results um, maybe that can actually be part of that previous commit because that's basically the same um, yeah let's just add that in because it's not an important change It's just now it's easier for me to, rather than returning a literal array there, now I can, now I can get some purchase on this. So how do I want to express this? You've got to be able to return a name Yeah, and the also oh, see at the moment Oh dear. Yeah, this is kind of problematic because at the moment Oh no, how am I going to deal with this? <laughs> um, currently, there's a separate piece of code that deals with, like I, I was just pausing there because I was confused about why the function name isn't going anywhere. And I think that's because it's in build initial context. This is where the name of the function is actually used um, and gets added to the identifier context um, unfortunately there's a this is more complicated if the function doesn't have a name I mean maybe I <laughs> Maybe I just don't need to do it this way. Like if the function doesn't have a name here, then why does it matter that we synthesize a fresh one here? Because I think when, I think when the export gets parsed it's probably just going to turn into an index anyway yeah so this is the the name so sorry i'm not being very articulate so what's going on here is the when we parse a function if it's using this export abbreviation then we're supposed to generate so if, if the function doesn't have a name we're supposed to cook up a new name for the function so that we can refer to it in the export so it was anonymous but we've decided to call it foo and that name foo is just used to tie the export to the function definition um, and then in the initial context the name foo is used to you know we populate the initial context so that the name foo maps to the correct index of this function definition and so this export is able to when we try to turn foo into an into an index we can look it up in the identifier context so it's all a little bit circuitous the way this is specified right now um so I'm just wondering whether there's a way to cut out the middleman and not have to deal with that at all. Uh, how can I? Uh, 
Um, I'm having trouble thinking about how to deal with this problem. Um, how can I start getting some purchase on this? I mean, do I even have any anonymous functions in here? Yeah, I mean, they're all anonymous. <laughs> None of these have got an identifier. So when we generate the export, there's got to be a way to tie the export to the the function. Um, so I'm just thinking, now I'm thinking about how much do I care about separating exports from functions? Do I do I need to be able to pull out multiple AST nodes that separately represent exports and functions? Because that's what creates the difficulty of then tying them back together again using an ID that's been generated. Or is there a way that I can just... Like, could I just as well have dealt with this by just allowing a function to have multiple export names and by making the function body optional, which I guess it sort of is, because it can just be, the expression can just be no instructions. Um, what would that look like? That would mean that I would need to sort of overload the concept of a function definition. I would have to say that a function definition can either be a normal function definition or it can be a sort of an imported function or it can be a function that has more than zero exported names. And I mean, I guess that's currently what I'm doing. At the moment, I've got an, a single optional exported name. So in terms of supporting what we see in exports like this stuff only requires that you support multiple exported names um you know i'm not having to deal with imports yet uh um Is it possible for me to make this simpler? <sighs> because this business about synthesizing a fresh name, the reason this is difficult is because it's split across two different places. There's one line of code here that's trying to read the name of the function to put it into the initial context. And if the function is anonymous, this doesn't get a name at all. Whereas when I'm parsing the function and I realize that it's got that it's being exported, then I'm supposed to cook up a fresh name for it and use that as the identifier for it. And ultimately this export is supposed to contribute to the identifier context, I think. Like if I look down and say, oh no, the exports don't, but the imports do. Oh, it's the, yeah, it's the, the function name here is supposed to contribute to the, the initial import. So if I, if I've expanded this abbreviation and decided to invent the name foo for this function, then I need foo to be part of the initial context here so that the initial identifier context gets the name foo in it. Um... And it just seems too complicated for now. So I th think... I think that what I'm going to do for now, rightly or wrongly, 
is back out of this change I'm making to have this return. I mean, I'm glad, you know, I'm glad I thought about this in the context of something that's already supposed to work because this is already doing my head in. But I think what I'm going to do is back out of this change, having it return an array and instead make exported name into exported names so that it could be multiple names and make it possible for in future to annotate this function as being an import as well. So this is going to be a little bit more complicated because it means that when you're cooking up the initial context, you're going to have to look inside these function definitions to see whether any of them have got import, have got abbreviations for this import syntax. But I think that's a lesser evil than separating out imports and exports into their own AST node. Um, so yeah, I think, I'm sorry, I know I'm not being very articulate with this explanation, but I'm having trouble like articulating it in my own brain. But I think for now, what I'm going to do is continue down the path of allowing information about exporting to piggyback on other AST nodes. And for now, it's only functions that they piggyback on, but I think what I'm saying here is that I'm gonna do the same thing for globals. That it's gonna be possible to have multiple exported names for a global. Um, so let's just do that. Let's. I'm not gonna revert that previous commit. I'm gonna just change it back. You know, I'm not going to tell Git to revert it. I'm just going to change it back. Um, uh, oh, maybe I will just maybe I will just get Git to revert it. So let's say it's not just going to be a yeah, let's screw it. Let's just revert it. I'm trying to, what I'm thinking about here is that I'm trying to leave a meaningful sequence of commits that correspond to what I've done in the video here. So I'm thinking I'm making a meta decision here about like I mean, I could just throw, this is the most recent commit, so I could just step back and throw it away, but I'm going to revert it and say, um, um, uh, let's say back out of uh, returning an array of results from parse function. Uh, I've changed my mind about this because it is for now going to be too complicated to split out exports and in future imports into their own independent AST nodes uh, due to the complexity of creating fresh identifiers uh, to match anonymous functions to their corresponding exports. Uh, I can work around this by storing export and in future import information on the function AST node itself. which is a little bit of a hack 
but is going to make my life easier in the short term. I might revisit this decision once I've got single pass parsing working because then it may become more feasible to create a fresh identifier in a single place and reuse it between the export node and the function node. Okay. Right, so now Yes, I really want to write to it. <laughs> okay, so now I've made this change, given the function exported names. And so this instead is going to be uh, exported names is an empty array. and we're gonna add it on, and then this is now gonna be called exported names. Let's break this out into a separate bit because that's becoming a little bit, it's becoming a little bit crowded. Um, So that's changed to exported names. Uh, the interpreter cares about that. So this should now be include. I think that should be okay. So Right, so in this parse function, we basically ignore the name of the function is what I'm trying to remember for myself is like, we parse function definitions twice. We parse it once in build initial context and there we use the name and then we parse it again in parse function and there we ignore the name and we use everything else. So I just need to get that through my head that the, the function's direct name doesn't matter here this is just our opportunity to pull out all of the exported names. And conversely, they don't matter for the initial context. Because for the initial context, we only need we only need to know about names that are within that are in scope for the duration of this module, which includes any imported names. So we are going to have to worry about this, but not any exports. The exports are only visible outside. Excuse me. <clears throat> So at least now I've got a strategy for how am I dealing with this issue? And the answer is I'm sort of overloading the function definition AST node to support this, to support exporting. So that will allow more of this to be parsed, I think. Um, Um, I'll forget it. Okay, so we're still having trouble parsing this. Uh, 
anyway, I should, um, I should commit this, shouldn't I? Um, so this is support multiple exported names for function definitions. So let's say, um, as explained in the previous commit, we are, for now, going to overload function definitions to also represent function exports. Um, because it's legitimate to export a function multiple times, uh, to export the same function multiple times within a single definition, we need to be able to store all of these exported names uh, as part of the functions overloaded <laughs> AST node, not just the first or last such name. Okay, so that seems okay. What's the problem with exports? Because this is this is what I'm driving at at the moment. Like, it seems like superficially I should be able to Oh, right, so these things are abbreviations. These are straight up exports. Uh, God, this is... Um, how am I gonna deal with this? Because this is the same thing but turned inside out like exports oh no hold on it's not so bad yeah sorry i thought i was um i thought i'd made a I thought this was going to be a nightmare. Basically, I thought that you'd be able to have an inline function definition inside an export and that it was uh, going to be a real mess, but actually it's not. Um, these exports are very... The syntax of top-level exports is actually very limited, which is a real relief. So all you can do is just say... Um, under what name am I exporting the thing? And then what kind of thing am I exporting? Um, uh, but frustratingly, how do I make this? Oh. <laughs> how do I make this compatible with what I just decided? Am I just going to have two sets of exports? Like, there are the exports that live on the function definitions, and then there are the sort of standalone exports that actually get their own AST node. Oh, God. Um, oh, this is horrible. This is really horrible. Uh... So I've got two choices here. Either I'm going to double up on this and say, you know, there are two ways to export a function as far as the AST is concerned. Is that like either you have an export name on the function definition itself, which is what you get when there's an abbreviation, or you have this explicit export, which just has to refer to the index of the function. 
And so the interpreter, when it's resolving an export, it has to check both of those things. It has to look through the function definitions and it also has to look through the exports. That's one option. And the other option is that I find a way to consolidate them. Instead of having two different mechanisms for it, I have a single consolidated mechanism, which is obviously what the what the spec is trying to get you to do is to have these exports as the single consolidated mechanism, and that's why you have the that's why you create the identifier so that this top level export has got an identifier to refer to even if the even if the exported function is actually anonymous. Um oh dear. What a mess. Um I think for now I'm just going to do the stupidest thing possible, which is to double up on it, I think. To make it more difficult for the interpreter to resolve an export by having more than one place that it can live. Because I think right now that's going to be simpler for me to get correct than to try and deal with this like unified approach that is somehow able to generate like I'm just thinking about whether it's somehow possible to generate the appropriate export nodes for the AST at the point where the function is parsed because you know what the function index is going to be. Like, even if it's anonymous, or perhaps especially if it's anonymous. You don't need to look up a name. You can just tell what its index inside the module is going to be. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, Roman says... I'm going to do the stupidest thing possible, you say, while making something so complicated I got lost when I started watching. Yeah, I'm sorry, it is getting a little bit complicated, but I'm... I am trying to keep it simple for my own sake. Um, I, I just feel like I've really painted myself into a corner with the way that this... the way that the pause is working, basically. It's really hard for me to for me to do the right thing here. Um, let me just think about this again. So how would it work? If I did want to make it possible to parse a function and to generate all these exports, Okay, I'm, I think I probably could make it work, but I'm just going to try to, yeah, I'm going to try to commit to something that I think, to, to, to the, the stupid thing that I'm talking about. Um, so let me just think about how that's going to work. So what that means is, this is going to generate, we're going to have a new kind of, we're going to have a new kind of AST node that represents an export, right? Like right now, we can't even parse this export. It's just blowing up and saying, 
Wow, something bad. Um, Uh, what's this doing? Reading list from Dollar Funk Export. Oh, so this I think is unhappy with the notion of modules having an identifier. That's not so hard to fix. I can I think I can just fix that up. Um Let's just let it have an optional identifier. So the saying invoke dollar funk E. Yes, yeah, so this is also something that we don't syntactically support yet. Um, oh, this is all such a mess, isn't it? Uh, Okay, let's give modules an optional name. So this is going to I'm going to put the name in here. It's not really parse text fields. Let me just look at the syntax of modules, but I'm pretty sure that I'm doing the right thing here. Uh, module ID. Yeah, well, I mean, this is all about the text format, isn't it? So yeah, a module may optionally bind an identifier that names the module. Says the name serves a documentary role only. Well, that's not true for tests because apparently you can <laughs> you can mention the name of it. Um, so yeah, I mean maybe this maybe it says this here. Yeah. So, okay. Um, so what have I done there? Yeah, so hopefully... Uh, what's the problem with this now? Oh yeah, it doesn't know about module names in the... When you say, when, when we say invoke, it doesn't know. Um, okay, yeah, well this is... Uh, I'm really all over the place with this uh, in this session. I'm sorry. It's um, I perhaps should have. I feel like I'm just flying by the seat of my pants without an, without a plan of attack, which is uh, not necessarily conducive to me giving a clear explanation of what I'm trying to do, and I'm really just bouncing off one problem after another here, and and just trying to hack my way through the undergrowth to try and get out of this mess that I've created for myself. Um, ultimately, maybe the problem is my poor choice of which test to try and get working first, because I've ended up picking on... Well, what I've done is I've chosen a, a sort of a densely knotted area of things that all depend on each other, and that doesn't feel like a very easy starting point to start pulling on like a nice simple thread that, that that's then going to lead me to something more complicated. It's almost like I've got to solve the whole problem in one go. But let's just try and 
chip away at it incrementally. So this is um, support, parsing, optional, module, names. Um, uh, now let's say uh, the spec says that these are, that these names serve a documentary role only. But the test script syntax allows us to specify the name of a module uh, in invoke. So the names are meaningful as far as test scripts are concerned. Okay, so we need to be able to do that. And then we also need to be able to support So what's the syntax of invoking name question mark string? Yeah, invoke function export. Well, I mean, this is all fantastically well documented, isn't it? But I think we just have to assume that this name is a module name. <laughs> um, So there's going to be a sort of a module name here. And just like we did here, we're going to say, if we can see an ID, actually, this should be a string that we're reading. Oh, well. Yeah, instead of read here, this should be like parse string, but whatever. Um, it doesn't matter as long as it's the same in both places. And I assume that when we're exporting stuff, yeah, in parse function, when we were exporting stuff, we were also just doing read here. <laughs> so, um, Let's say something like uh, when reading an exported name and when reading uh, uh, when reading an exported name in a function definition as well as when reading an exported name in an invoke action we should be parsing it as a quoted string not just reading a raw atom it doesn't really matter um, this doesn't really matter because we only care about equality of these two values but it'd be clearer but it would make the parsing code easier to read if we were explicit about the fact we expect to read a string at this point. Okay, I'll come back to that later. Um, okay, um... So this should be module name and then invoke needs to have an optional module name. Ah. Uh, 
Yes. Okay. Well, this is a syntax that we don't even vaguely support yet, so that's fine. So let's just deal with this change. So this is support parsing optional uh, module name in invoke. Um, if present, this tells us specifically which module we're trying to invoke a function from. Okay, so now get is clearly a problem. Uh, And what's the idea of get? So this looks like, oh, what does this say? Get global export. So this is about reading a global variable from a module. So we're gonna need, we're just gonna need to support that in the parser. We're gonna need get, um, so we know this is going to have an optional module name. It's going to have the name of the global. Uh, that's it. And we're going to need something a little bit like parse invoke, but it's going to be parse get. We're going to read get. We're going to read an optional module name. Uh, and then we're going to read the name. Uh, invoke or get action because the same thing applies here we should really be parsing that string you know this e here that we need to we've got a method here called parse string which strips the quotes off and it unescapes any escaping that appears inside that so it understands um, WebAssembly string syntax. So yeah, we should have the ability to parse get here and then wherever invoke can appear inside a cert return, um, We also have to be able to, we have to be able to support, oh dear. So this really needs to be action, doesn't it? Um, So we want to say like action equals if can read list starting with invoke uh, else if can read list starting with get parse get and I guess we're going to raise otherwise <laughs> um, oh actually oh god uh, oh no we always need the expecteds okay it's just the action yes okay that's fine that's fine so This needs to be action. And then in the interpreter, we've already got a case for when the action is an invoke. And you can see that we're already 
sort of pattern matching that. Um, so that's fine. So this should be okay parsing wise and it shouldn't, I think it shouldn't break any of the existing tests. Because as long as all your, all of the existing tests just use uh, invoke, they don't use get. So those should be okay. Um, but then for exports, oh yeah, this didn't work because it should be lib. Oh, something's gone wrong in the parser. Parse table. Is this related? Probably. Um, I think what I'm going to do to focus my attention is just use a cut down version of this for now. Um, So maybe just copy, oh, it's exports. Okay, yeah, so that hasn't broken the, um, So I'll say support parsing the get action in addition uh, in an assert return inside. Um, so let's say none of the currently parsing tests use this, but exports.west does, and that's what I'm working on right now. Okay, and then this is just to prevent this from turning into too much of a yak shave. Let's just for now concentrate on the functions and the globals because those are things that I should in principle be able to make work. Um, Right. I mean, I can see that, you know, a problem is going to occur here because up until now, we've just been always been referring to the most recent module. And you can see here that this has been specifically designed so that we define this module and we give it an identifier and then we define some sort of dummy modules and then we try to invoke back into this previously defined module. And right now, every time we define a new module, that just clobbers the current module inside the interpreter. So I can see that we're gonna have to hold on to all of the modules, I think, and and then look through them to find the one with the right identifier. Um, so let's try running just this. Okay, good. So having cut this down to size and got rid of all of the table related stuff, I can now sort of focus my attention uh, on this. Couldn't find function E, could be binary skipping. Right, well, function E, although this isn't a failure, it's not right because you should be able to find function E. Um, I mean, I, I'm not sure I understand why. Oh, well, it's, yeah, it's because I don't, because I don't support exports yet. <laughs> um, right, so yeah, there are multiple problems here. The first problem, the, the reason this one is saying couldn't find function E is because I don't support exports yet. So I think this is where I can start getting some purchase on it and say like, 
I want to be able to generate and sort of export node in the AST here that refers to F and keeps track of the fact that it's being exported as E. And then I'm going to have uh, the bigger problem of referring to a different module than the most recent one. But I think just getting this first one to pass right now is, you know, enough of a challenge to be getting on with. Um, so to make this work, I'm going to need to record this. So it's going to be like, What's the name of the thing being exported? What kind of thing is it? I'm going to say kind because it's a function. Um, I can just use symbols for this for now, but maybe I, maybe I should have separate AST nodes for the different kinds of export here. But for now, I'll just say it's a colon func um, and then this is going to be index of in this case a function because this is a function export so that's what the AST is going to look like in the parser So here, I think for the initial context, it's fine for me to just ignore it. Oh, no, hold on. That's me ignoring it in the initial context. I need to actually do something here. This needs to be exports, parse export now, because I want to be able to create one of those AST nodes. Um. Um, I'm not sure where to put this. So here there was parse function, parse memory, parse table, parse global, parse type, parse data. I'll put it after parse global, why not? And that's sort of before all of the numeric opcode, you know, all of the actual instructions, I suppose. This is all still module business here. So parse export, read export. Um, Okay, yeah, so this is just peaking. So I do need to read export. Uh, and then just remind me of the syntax of this. So we need export, and then we read a name, which is just a string. Um, oh, I guess it's, I guess we do it this way. Yeah, that's what I did in parse get. So we read export, we read the name. And then there always has to be this export description and it's always a list. So I'm just going to say read list do. Um, well, so this is going to be like kind um, index. Equals read list do. I'll flush that out in a second. And then this is going to return export dot new name kind index. Is that what I called them? Yeah. 
So now I've just got to arrange for this to, it's gonna have func table memory or global as the kind. And then, it, and then there's gonna be an index. Um, so let's say here case read in func. Um, we're gonna return a symbol that says that it's a function and then I need to look up, is there like a context dot? Do I look up, well, let's see in like parse call. So I do context dot functions. Oh, I can just call parse index and I pass in context.functions, yeah, of course. Um, so the reason I'm doing that is because I want, I want to read an index, an identifier, um, right, it doesn't have to be an identifier, it could be a numeric index. So this is the right thing to do because parse index will either it, it will tell the difference between if it's reading, yeah, it's reading an index which might be an identifier, but it might just be a number. And so this is gonna say, if I've read an identifier, then I need to dereference it in, in, the, in the identifier context to turn it into a number, otherwise it, it is already a number. So that's exactly what I want. Um, and then this is going to raise an exception if it finds anything other than funk, because at the moment funk is all I know how to support. So let's just look at what I've done there. I mean, I've said shovel this onto exports. Is exports even a thing? I don't think it is. No. Okay, so now when we parse the text fields, oh, but this is all gonna try, parse text fields, I think, is just used to make something that gets splattered into the constructor of modules. So I'll also need, exports in here. Okay. Okay, does this at least not break the existing tests? And also, what does it do to... Oh, crap. That is not what I wanted to do. Um, it's okay, I still had it in my buffer. Okay. Uh, missing keyword exports. Why has that happened? I thought I included it. Oh, I need it in here as well. What's gone wrong here? Oh, because I've got exported globals as well. Well. Maybe let's just focus on functions for now, eh? See how far we can get. Still no good. Oh, I'm running the wrong file. Okay, so we still haven't found that function, but at least nothing's broken. 
Okay, so pending test failed successfully. So let's see how much of this, can I just add this? Yeah, I think I'm gonna say, I think I'm just gonna make this a single change. Um, so let's say parse top level exports uh, and add them to module AST nodes. Um, I'm focusing on function exports right now. So those are the only ones I'm currently supporting. Okay, so now this is what I was, Roman, I don't know if you're still here, but what I was talking about as being the simple thing is now I've arranged for the abstract syntax tree to contain some extra nodes that record the fact that, for example, inside this module here, we are exporting a function called E, we're calling it E, and it's going to be this function F. So what I need to do is when we do this invoke here, I need to check. At the moment, I'm checking for sort of inline exports inside the function definition, but I need to also check for these sort of top level exports if that fails, I guess. So So let's look in here. So here we go, assert return, invoke, function equals, I mean, there, there must be more than one place where I'm doing this, current module functions detect. Oh, right. Why don't I extract that? <laughs> um, let's say uh, find function uh, module mod name. So for now, I'm going to stick that in there. But just, just because I can see there's uh, more than one place where I'm doing this. Uh, and actually, I should say, um, current module name. Well, let's keep it simple. Let's make it be find the function in the current module, basically. I'm, I'm sort of thinking ahead and, you know, I know that I'm going to have to prov provide the ability to look in different modules, but for now, let's just keep it like this. So, so this is going to be the same as this. So this is just uh, extract, find function helper and in interpreter. Um, this is done, this is currently done in two places, assert, return and invoke. And exports are about to make it more complicated. So let's consolidate into a single place. Okay, so this is where all of the this is where all of the mess is going to be hidden. The fact that we don't just look in one place. 
Um, this is going to be or current module dot exports. Uh, how's this going to work? So we want to. So what we want to do is find an export. So, okay, let's just say function equals that. Um, if function is nil, and then we're going to return function at the end. <laughs> so we're going to try to find, this is our first attempt to find the function, is look through all of the functions in the current module and, I mean, maybe, maybe this would be slightly easier to read if I did this. So we're going to look through all of the functions in the current module. We're going to look for ones that say that they're ex one of their exported names is the one we were looking for. If that fails, then what we're going to do is say export equals current module dot exports detect do export. Can we just say export in um, kind is func and name is name? And then you know, if that was successful, unless export is nil, then function is equal to, so now we've got to look it up. Because export's just got the index. So is it just current module dot functions dot slice? Yeah, that's what we do when we call. So it's going to be that same thing. Yeah, because if we've if we found an export, then we have to. Well, so this is going to be index equals export index. No, that's okay, I'll just do it in line. So, the million dollar question is, does that make any difference to this test? Undefined method exports for module. Oh, right. Okay. So this is a different, this is an, in, this is an instance of a module. So we need to add this in. Uh, exports equals mod.exports. Um, and add in exports here. Ah, look, <laughs> there are a couple of passing tests there. Okay. So this is, <laughs> I mean, I realized that's a small win, 
but that means that the exports are being looked up successfully. So there's a couple of changes there. There's this. Um, so this is something like add exports to uh, like runtime module. runtime module instance. Um, these are just copied from the AST, from the modules AST node. Uh, we need them. Uh, to resolve exported mod, uh, function names. To resolve uh, functions to resolve exports, yeah, non inline exported functions. Let's say resolve the names of non inline exported functions. Okay. And then So now we're going to say use uh, module exports uh, as a fallback when looking up exported function names. We can say uh, it's now the case that somewhat unfortunately exported function names are available in two different places inline exports um, um, store names on the function definition itself And top level exports so it's going to be this let's say uh, whereas top level exports store names uh, and indexes on the module So we need to look in two different places when trying to resolve exp an exported function name. It would obviously be better if we just kept the exported function names in one place, but I'm resigning myself to this hack for now so that I can get things working without having to worry about how to generate fresh identifiers for anonymous functions to tie them into the export AS the AST node and get those fresh identifiers into the identifier context. Okay. So I've somewhat justified myself there. All right, so it's a bit of an up uphill struggle, but now that's given us a mechanism for being able to look up at least basic function name. So these first two assertions are now working. I think that's the first piece of concrete progress that I've made in this stream is like previously, neither of these would have worked because this export, well, we can even parse it, but it wasn't having any effect. So now 
we've got a different problem. The reason why this one is saying uh, couldn't find function E could be binary skipping is because it's looking in this module, not this one. So we need to keep all of the modules that have been defined instead of just having current module. Um, we need to look up the one with the appropriate name. And I guess, I mean, oh, look, and these, I didn't notice these were green. So those three are passing as well. And then we're just skipping all of the uh, assert invalids because I don't support that assertion at the moment. So, right. So this is, so actually that didn't just make the first two pass. It's made all of these pass as well because these are all top level exports that are all exporting function zero, i.e. this function that returns 42, but it's being exported under three different names. Um, we don't appear to be exercising the ability to actually call, you know, we're not, we don't seem to be using this. The fact that you can inline export a function under multiple names isn't actually being used here. Because I guess the test is assuming that the abbreviation is just being expanded and there's a single underlying mechanism for dealing with this. But at the moment, that's not true for my implementation. I mean, at some point I need to, I do need to get my head around having a more general solution to expanding abbreviations because this is turning into a real headache but for right now I'm making progress so I'm just going to keep chipping away at it so um so actually all of these assertions about module exports are passing except for this one and that's just because I don't support referring to this module by name so let's get that working um so I think the way that that's going to work instead of saying self.currentModule equals module new, I think what this is gonna have to become is self.modules is the empty array. And then here, this is gonna have to be self.modules. We shovel this onto the end. And then I think there needs to be a current module that's modules dot last I think that's going to preserve the existing behavior oh except that attribute needs to exist um, so this needs to be modules Okay. So this is going to say, you know, remember all defined modules, not just the most recent one. And I'm going to say uh, this is necessary so that invoke and, well, it's really a cert return and invoke can optionally name, or I can optionally identify which modules exported function they wish to call instead of always assuming the most recently defined module. Okay. Um, So how often do I say current module? <sighs> um, 
this is potentially really problematic. Um, <laughs> uh, because there's loads of places where we use the current module. So I think maybe I was premature in removing it. Yeah, I think what I should have done here Yeah, I can just amend this commit. So really, I think I should have I think I should have just added in all of the modules. Well, let's be let's be consistent with this. So we've got a current module and then we've got all the modules and we've got the stack and the tags. Um, here, when I add it on, I should just do current module equals modules dot last and then not have this, not have this helper. And then, and then they'll, I'm just going to use mutation to set the current module at the appropriate time because there are so many places where I expect the current module to be set. It's just going to be a nightmare to have to specify all over the place what module I'm talking about. So Yes, I think that's a more sensible change. And hopefully it doesn't disrupt anything. So now all I need to do is when we're in, uh, is it just an invoke or yeah, in inside a s invoke and inside assert return. Oh, cause at the moment, I'm just ignoring the module name. So I just need to, yeah, I just need to include module name here. And here and before I find the function I need to say self dot current module equals find module module name <laughs> and do the same down here so this is obviously a little bit gross but I think this is going to be the easiest way to keep everything working in the presence of this is, yeah, uh, maybe that means I don't need to set current module here anymore then because, yeah, because the only way you know, it's only meaningful for there to be a current module within the context of you're doing an invoke or you're doing an assertion and that is going to set the current module. Um, 
Yeah, so I think that should be okay. And I just need to define find module. Name. Uh, if name is nil, then it's just modules.last. Else, it's modules.detect mod mod dot uh, is it just name hold on I don't even put it in so we need to put the name in uh name equals mod dot name here we need to specify the name I think that's it Ah, there we go. Okay, so that is definitely progress. Um, this is one change. Yeah, it's a bit of a mess. I think it's just this change that I want. So I'm just adding name to runtime modules, basically. Um, and name to runtime module instance. We need to remember this in order to look up the appropriate module instance if an assert return or invoke specifies a module name. Okay, and then I think this stands alone. Um, So this is saying um, reset current module in interpreter based on optional module name. Um, if no module name is provided, we default to the most recently defined module as before okay so that deals with all that so I feel like I finally got a bit of traction on exports and names and all that kind of stuff so I'm 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 glad that I took this detour into exports because this has given me a little bit of a sense of progress. Um, however, I'm pretty sure that all of the rest of this exports file is still failing. So I just undid the deletion of the globals stuff. Let's see how bad that situation is. Right. So this is complaining about the fact that it doesn't know how to export a global. Um, so here we can support that. Why 
likes it. I don't understand Vim sometimes, or indeed a lot of the time. So do I have this? Do I have... Is this a thing? Yes. Okay, that's good. So now we can support... You know, this business. So some of these are just using numeric indexes and some of them are using identifiers. So hopefully this is just leveraging all of the existing parsing gubbins that we have. Okay, so it, it parsed it successfully. So I think that means that's worth adding. Um, support um, global exports in parse export like this. But right, so this is saying this is sort of what we'd expect, is that in the interpreter, no matching pattern error, right, it doesn't, it doesn't understand how to assert a get action, because at the moment we've only got this, invoke, um, so how much of this, I'm sorry, I'm just going to copy this. Oh no, this is horrendous. Okay, I'm not going to copy all of it because it's so much. But essentially the problem is that when we get down to here, it doesn't know how to get E. <laughs> um, so I think what I need to do here is make some of this optional rather than hard coding this to only work with an invoke action so let's just have a nested case action in this is this is pretty simple minded um but I think this will do the trick. So there are two different situations that I expect here, right? There's invoke and then there's get. And unfortunately I can't, I can't do this in a single pattern match because Pattern, match, pattern matching syntax doesn't support that. So I have to have, I can't just have an alternative that pulls out the module name and the name. I have to handle these separately. But that's okay because I need to know which of these I'm getting anyway. Which if you are very generous would be a justification of why, um, why that restriction exists in the first place. Uh, but I don't buy that. Um, <laughs> yes, I, I did that wrong before. Okay, so how much of this is just to do with invoking a function? I 
I think maybe it's all that. And if I just, because um, what I want is to have something I can commit here that preserves the existing behavior. It hasn't improved that situation. But I think if I do that, it's going to, oh, it's a syntax error. Ugh, silly. Oh, it's just, yeah, I've just made a silly mistake. Okay. Right, okay. So it just, it doesn't work right because I've got that branch doing nothing. Um, but all of the existing tests should work fine. So I can just remove that. Um... So this is a uh, match invoke. So let's say separately match invoke inside assert return. And I'll say, um, so that we can alternatively match a get node without having to duplicate the entirety of the assert return handler, only some of which is invocation specific, function invocation specific. So yeah, all of the function invocation specific stuff is inside there now. Okay, and now I can stick this in and we can do a different thing in this case. And our job here is just to populate actual values, I think. In fact, I think what I'm going to do is move this here because this is a sense check on the zip. Yes, so that's applicable either way because the, the, the job of this bit of code is to populate actual values. Um, I think that's the only thing we care about in inside here. So, okay, yeah, let's think about what we need to do. So first we, we still need to set the current module based on the module name that's provided here. but then we just need to read the global. We've already got the name of it. Oh, but we've got to look up the index. Interesting. <laughs> okay. Um, So it's going to be something like this because this always oh no because globals can have an inline export as well can't they right we're not we're not recording the exported name of the global at this point um So globals here don't have a
they don't have a representation at runtime. We've just got an array of values. Maybe that's, no, that's not okay. I was gonna say maybe that's okay, but it isn't because we need to be able to look up their names. I mean, actually, I say that. I don't think any of the assertions here do that. Because this is just checking that, this, that syntactically we can provide... <sighs> yeah, this is just checking that syntactically we can support inline exports. So, like, the abbreviation... I think the fact that it doesn't do anything isn't going to matter because the only assertions we're doing are about explicit exports, not abbreviated ones. So I think I can actually get away with fudging this for now. So let's fudge it and get, get it passing. So this will say... Um, this. <laughs> uh, export equals current module globals. Oh no, sorry. Exports detect kind global. Name is name. Yeah, this is like all rays. Because if we can't find it, then that's a real problem. Or maybe we'll say, well, why don't I put this in a find export? There's no, there's no harm in it, is there? Well, there's really no point in having that name. So at the moment, this is the only way that we can find them. Um, oh, hold on. Let's just, no, let's just do, sorry, I wasn't thinking straight. Let's just make this find global. So let's say, still, export equals this, and then we'll say, unless export is nil, global equals current module dot globals slice export index or raise. So this is going to do exactly the same thing as, as this chunk of code here, where it's like, and the only difference is that we're looking at the global exports. So we're saying go through all the exports in the module. If you can find a global one with that name, then retrieve that retrieve the global with that index and then i guess here i'm just going to return global okay so let's say global equals And then I'm just going to say, well, let's have a similar situation here. And then here, actual values is just going to be, at the moment, the globals are literally just the values of the globals. So let's see what happens. Hey, that works. Um, let 
let's just raise for now because that's that's clearly not needed you know i i thought maybe it would be needed um but we don't need it yet and if this raise starts causing problems then i will gladly replace it with a warning once i've verified that it's it's because of you know this could be binary question mark has already kind of you know, this is really a test failure in some cases. It's just that I'm not able to distinguish when it is a test failure. So I'd rather not recreate that situation unless it's absolutely necessary. So, okay. So that works now. Um, let's say support get action inside assert return um, I think maybe we should have a to do inside here just to record the fact that it's like to do uh, check um, globals exported names first And then I can say, uh, ultimately, we want to also check globals exported names, i.e. when an abbreviation, when an export abbreviation has been used to provide names in line. Um, but at the moment, globals are only represented by their values at runtime, so we don't have anywhere to store the exported names. Once we need this, it'll be easy enough to wrap up the names and values together. But uh, exports.wast doesn't require this, so I'm waiting until I have a failing test. Okay, um, how much further do I want to go with this? This is really just about parsing. This is also just about parsing because I don't support a certain invalid here. So I wonder how far away am I from being able to make this whole thing pass? So this is complaining about table and there's no reason why I can't do this. But I'm not sure that I have this. Right. So this is still sort of awaiting support in the identifier context like we're not making any effort at the moment to keep track of all of these table names so here we don't currently have a way to look up this dollar a and match it to the index of this table because we're not populating the initial identifier context with all the table names now it's easy enough to do but we just haven't needed to do it yet and and this test i don't think gives me any ex any reason to do it so what's this doing this was the error we were getting before no implicit conversion of array into string 
block in parse table. So is this just an unsupported piece of syntax? Uh, parsing table from S expression inspect. Let's see, because if this is easy to fix, then I should just deal with it. So table export a zero funk ref. Oh. So I need in inside parse table, I need some code that is able to match multiple exports. Um, just like I did in function definitions. Like, did I already do that for globals? Or Right, yeah, I mean, I must have literally just done this, but I just forgot about it. Um, so let's just check it out syntactically. Um, does a table have the same abbreviations? Because if it does, I might as well just stick them in import export yeah so let's just do the same thing here um uh sorry uh So this is going to allow us to just skip over. I think. What do I actually need for this? Let's let's copy this instead. Because um, I think this is what's needed, really. Oh, yeah. So it does want to look it up. Um, so I think I guess I'll just do read here. It's not going to be used. Right, the reason we could get away with this is because up until now, everywhere that we've seen, everywhere we've got a call in direct, it always just uses the index directly. It doesn't use an identifier. Whereas here we do have an identifier, so I just need to I just need to read it. But this is not gonna leave an index, it's gonna leave an identifier, and that's not something that the interpreter knows how to deal with. So it's sort of fortunate that we're not actually using it.
Okay, so now let's go back to that exports.last and cut it down to just the tables stuff. Okay, so that stuff all works. Um, okay, so that's Um, so this is um, support passing multiple exported names for tables. Um, these are currently ignored but we'll need to store them in the AST eventually. And this is uh, support parsing um, Support dummy table exports in parse export. We don't currently have an index space with which to resolve table identifiers. So I'm just putting the identifier. <laughs> uh, So I'm just recording the identifier instead. We'll need to fix this once we have uh, tables index space. Once the identifier context has a tables index space. Okay. So yeah, it's just this last bit now. And again, I guess it's more parsing trouble. Um, I'm, I'm battling on with this because we're now very close to being able to add exports.west move exports.west to the list of passing tests, which would feel like I'd made a tiny bit of progress. And at the moment, all of the horribleness of how I've implemented this is hidden away inside some helper functions inside the interpreter. So I, I don't need to lose too much sleep over the fact that I've got this slight bodge of whenever I've got an exported function or an exported global or, well, it's actually just exported functions that use this bodge at the moment. Um, I'm recording the exported names in two different places because that's the easiest thing to do in the parser, even though the interpreter has to do twice the amount of work to, to resolve those names. Um, there's no one single place for it to look for the interpreter to look, but I can, I can definitely, definitely live with that for now in order to get more test passing. And then I'm going to need to come back to this and figure out like, how do I, <sighs> yeah, basically how do I make this less problematic in the future? How can I tidy it up and not have this sort of horrible, <laughs> horrible situation in the future? Um, My camera's gone a bit funny. I think the color, oh no, that's made it worse. The color balance is really strange. 
sorry, I didn't mean to go all blue <laughs> or all green or whatever it is that I've gone. Anyway, doesn't matter. Um, it's the, it's all of the exciting technical content that's the draw here, not the image of my face. Um, okay, well, look, this is, let's flesh this out because this is the last one that we need to support need to support memory here memory um i'm pretty sure i don't have no and i mean it's a bit problematic isn't it because we don't support multiple memories and i don't think that the identif well let's see Yeah, we do put we do put these into the So, yeah, this is going to be a similar situation. Maybe I should have made this one nil. Oh well, let's see what happens. A syntax error is what happens. Oh, what a disaster. Okay, so this is a similar deal, right? Where like, we don't support exports in the in the memory. I think that's it. I think it's an inline export that's causing the problem there. Um, export A. Where is that here? Yeah. So similar kind of deal. Um, parse memory. So what did I do for parse table? This. I mean, memory doesn't even appear to support reading an identifier, so that's a bit sad. Let's put both of them in while we're at it. Hey. All right, yeah, no one even tries to use any of this, so it doesn't matter that we don't have that hooked up to anything. Um, so yeah, this is many problems piling on top of other problems. Um, so I think actually I don't need to bother making this be meaningful because no one ever looks at it anyway. So let's say, yeah, I'm pretty sure I needed, I'm pretty sure I needed that identifier thing. Let's just double check that, but because it was a bit naughty of me to put it in speculatively, but I'm pretty sure it wouldn't work without that, yeah. Huh, that's actually not the failure I was expecting, but. So it's interesting, isn't it? Because that name needs to go away. 
So I think I should not. Because that actually needs to be, the, the, those table names need to be used in build initial context, not inside here. So that's a sort of a relic. Um, So let's say support parsing memory names. And then support parsing multiple exported names for memories. These are like memory names themselves, currently ignored. Um, and then this is just support dummy memory exports in parse export. Like the table exports, these aren't currently exercised anywhere by any tests so they're not yet properly implemented okay and I think that that means that now as part of that commit I think I need to move exports to the list of passing tests because it should now all be working Come on, that memory grow test has really got a lot to answer for, in my opinion. I should have, uh, yes, error, pending test passed. Okay, great. So that means I can move this to here. Okay, great. All right, so I have, for better or worse, I have now sort of fleshed out an implementation strategy, at least as far as functions go, for how I intend to initially get exports working, which is that I'm splitting the responsibility, I'm sort of labeling functions with their export names, and I'm also separately accumulating these top level exports and I'm teaching the interpreter to look in both of those places when resolving exported function names. So I've now completely forgotten what was going on in global um, but I expect it was to do with exporting globals. So let's see Uh, global dot last. Okay. So we are parsing it successfully, which I think was probably the case before. No matching pattern error. So I did have a stash here. So this was, right, this was the approach that I eventually changed my mind about. So I'll actually drop that. Of allowing parsing a global to potentially return 
some exports. And I think I've now changed my mind about that. And what I instead want is to record any of these export names on the global itself. But I do just want to understand what's going on here. I probably did already understand this, but it's already fallen out of my brain. Oh yeah, okay, right. So this is, right, I'm so I'm gonna have to finesse this quite a bit because this is assuming that every global has an associated expression, which it clearly doesn't. Um, it's only well what I need to do to fix this most present problem is what do I want to do I mean, basically, I think I'm going to need global objects. <laughs> um, which I sort of already said I wanted anyway. But the immediate problem here, this is a test that doesn't actually execute, that doesn't actually, I don't think it cares about the value of these. Um... I think what I need to do is just have some way of, well, let's just put a hack in here that says, I think if global.value isn't, I think I wanna say empty array, then we're in this situation. Yes, oops. If it's an empty array, then we haven't been given an initializer expression or whatever it's called. Yeah, in it. But the only time that that's legitimate is when instead we've been given an import. So I wonder if there's, rather than setting myself up to fail in the future, maybe I can come up with a way to record Well, record the fact that import has been used here. Because effectively we get this instead of the initialization expression, right? We still get the type, but before the type we get an import and that means there will be no initialization expression and it means that this global doesn't need to be initialized because it's not actually defined here. It lives in another module. Um, I'm just um, trying to decide how properly to do this, but I think I mean, this is essentially not right. 
Um, uh, let's just refactor this because, yeah, it's not right and it doesn't match what we're doing in other places. Like, this is the right thing to do. Deal with all the exported names. I think this will, I think it will still pass successfully. Because this is actually what the syntax says. It says you can have as many exports as you like, because this is recursive essentially. This this gets applied, this all abbreviations get applied recursively. So you can say global foo, export, 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 export. These will all be expanded and, and add additional export names, exported names for this global. And then right at the end, you could optionally have a single import. And if that is present, then it changes. Yeah, it changes the behavior of how we parse this, basically. So let's take it a step at a time. So this is um, support reading multiple exported names. Well, how did I describe this in other places? Yeah. Support parsing multiple exported names for globals. Um, and then we have to change the logic here, basically. Um, because if there is an import, then we don't read, we don't read a value. So we say if we can read list starting with import, then we have to do just this. Else, we do all this. Global type. So maybe we should have maybe it's worth extracting this. Uh, so does that currently do anything? So should this be pause or read? Maybe it's read. I'm not quite sure what I intended to do here. I mean, the best thing I can think of is that it seems like methods that start with pause return an AST node, whereas read Maybe that's not true. What do I what do I mean by these read? Yeah, these just like these just call read. And that's sort of what global type is doing here. Uh, oh, whatever. Let's just call it parse. I don't, you know, it, if I can't articulate what the difference is, then it's clearly not important. Um, so 
So I don't think I've broken anything by doing this. Uh, let's say extract parse global type helper from parse global. Um, so what was the Yes, I want to retain this, but otherwise I don't really care about that. I'm just going to make this be parse global type and also this. So syntactically, these are the two things that you're allowed to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Global? Yeah. Okay, so now a different problem. Oh yeah, because it's now, so this is slightly clearer, now that we're not even trying to parse instructions, the value here is, is nil. Um, so that's actually a slight improvement because we're not storing away, because this will happily read an empty array of instructions basically and store it in there. So I think having it be nil is, is probably better. Um, so let's say only try to parse uh, global, what does it call this? Initializer expression if there is no if there's no import uh, imported globals don't have an initializer because they don't even live in this module well let's say they live in a different module okay he says as if he knows what imported globals are, and I don't really, but I assume that they're just, they're globals in another module that we're making visible inside this one, basically. So if they're, when they were initialized, they were initialized as part of the instantiation of that module, not as part of the instantiation of this one. So, okay, pending test failed successfully. Um, so what's the next thing I want to do? That's what I'm thinking about. I think maybe what I could do is actually remember the import information. Like I might as well, I know I've been very slapdash about this, but like while I'm in here and I know what these are, this is the module name, and this is the name of the thing that's being imported, right? So here I can say module name comma name equals read list starting with import do. Um, I think it can just be read comma read. So I import module name, import name. I mean, this is probably, I probably need like a parse import helper, don't I? Um, I 
So hopefully that still works just as well. Yes. So maybe I could what I'm tr what I'm trying to work around to is finding a way to flag this global as having been imported so that instead of just checking for a nil initialization expression, I would rather check for this import information. Um, so I think if what I do is for the global, I have not just its value, but it's like import. Maybe I call it imported names. No, I'll just call it import because it's, it's actually different from this exported names. That's just an array of names. This is going to be uh, this would be like import value. Like for now, I'm just going to store an array. Um, and then in the interpreter, when we come to sort of instantiate these, I'm going to say like if global import nil, then do all of this, then else, don't do any of that, import the global, <laughs> uh, you know, import from another module. So this is going to be like module name name equals Uh, global import undefined method globals for nil okay we still didn't get anywhere So this was saying we got into evaluate expression. Oh, yes. Oh, this is a problem. We need a current module to be able to do evaluate expression here, but we haven't created the module yet. Oh no. Yeah, because we need to be able to support this. Um, I think that perhaps this needs to be done later. I think maybe we need to instantiate the module first, and then we need to go through and populate all of the globals. Um, okay, let's do this a step at a time. So 
So let's say uh, store import information on globals. And then this is Like without this, we have a different we have a different problem, right? Yes. So this fixes the immediate problem of um, only try to evaluate what's it called an initializer. Uh, for non-imported globals. Um, but then we've got the problem that we... So I think this probably needs to be like mod.globals.map. You know, nil or something. Like we need an array of globals here. And then after you know, it'd be like current module equals this self modules push current module uh, now let's just do self current module equals modules dot last uh, now what whatever. Yeah, this is a little closer to the way things currently work, right? Is that whenever we want to assume the implicit module, we just say self current module equals modules dot last. And then this is going to have to be Oh, sorry, I'm just thinking about what the right way to deal with this is. We've now got an array of the correct size that's just full of nils. And so I think maybe this is like with index do global index. Um, and this will be like current module dot globals index equals value and this is going to do current module dot globals index equals nil and this is now each with index do oh dear what a mess Okay, still not getting anywhere. Oh, because we can't evaluate ref null. Okay, so where's that? Where's that trying to happen? Right, okay. So yeah, before we even get to... I mean, wh where are the assertions in here? They must be a long way down. Right, so before we even try to get to any of these assertions, we're already trying to... instantiate this module which involves making this work 
and I don't know what ref null is supposed to do. So let's say here, um, uh, create, let's just say, initialize globals after module has been created. Oops. And we say, uh, this is necessary because we need to call uh, evaluate expression as part of um, computing. Yeah, computing the initial value of each global, but we can't call that without but we can't, well, let's say, but we shouldn't call that without having a current module set. So first we create the module, which itself doesn't involve evaluating any expressions, and then evaluate all of the initializer expressions, all of the global initializer expressions. Like I said, I think we need a better representation of globals than just storing their values here. I think this, I think we should have a sort of a runtime global object that knows things like what its name is um, or what its exported names are in the same way that the runtime function object knows what its exported names are, but we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. And I think we probably will come to it quite soon. Um, because I'm expecting this file to deal with inline global exports. Um, actually, I can't see any here, but there must be some. Um, So, okay, sorry, what was the problem again? My brain is really not working very well tonight, so maybe I should, maybe I should accept defeat before too long, but I just wanna, I, I wanna stop at something resembling a stable point, and at the moment we are definitely not at one. Okay, well, we kind of are, because we don't have the ability to evaluate ref null. Um, So let's at least add that in ref null. So what is that supposed to do? Instructions. Oh, it's in reference instructions, I think. These instructions produce a null value check for a null value or produce a reference to a given function respectively. What are references? Reference types classify first class references to objects in the runtime store. Okay, so this is the first I've heard of it. The store represents all global state that can be manipulated by WebAssembly programs. It consists of the runtime representation of all instances of functions, tables, memories, and globals, element segments, and data segments that have been allocated during the lifetime of the abstract machine. No element or data instance is addressed from anywhere else but the owning module instances. So, So is this, is this truly global? Like this is where all of the function instances live. It's a closure of the original function over the runtime module instance of its originating module. Okay, so the intention here is that ultimately all of these things don't actually live inside their originating modules. They get promoted up into this kind of global store where they all hang out with each other. Um, so 
so reference types classify first class references to objects in the runtime store. So you can either refer to a function or you can refer to all references to objects owned by the embedder and that can be passed into WebAssembly under this type. I assume this is the, yeah, the host environment, yeah. This is an interesting remark. Implementations need not maintain an actual operand stack. Instead, the stack can be viewed as a set of anonymous registers that are implicitly referenced by instructions. The type system ensures that the stack height and thus any reference register is always known statically. So that's certainly a change I could make is just get rid of the operand stack entirely, um, which has sort of been back at the back of my mind, but it's interesting to read it in the language specification that it's like, because you can annotate the whole program with what's the depth of the stack at this point in the program, you can always just say, well, um, let's number our registers R0 through R50, and then every single operation, we can just say it either stores its result or retrieves its arguments into or from the numbered registers whose numbers are statically known. So maybe at some point I'll do that. Um, Okay, I, was, I got a little bit, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> got slightly distracted there and also uh, slightly had a cough. So this is, yeah, okay. So this produces a reference that's pointing nowhere basically. Um, <coughs> I assume that this just pushes a null reference onto the stack. Execution, reference instructions. Ref.null, push the value ref.null t onto the stack. So it's just the, <coughs> the null value of, of type t. Um, So, I mean, I guess I'll use nil for that, at least for now. Hey, <coughs> some tests are passing. Implement the ref null instruction. Um, this instruction pushes a null reference onto the stack. So for now, I'll use nil to represent that. Okay. Uh, let me just amend that. Pushes a null reference to the object store. So let's just, I think I did sort of learn something here. So so this is to the runtime object store. <clears throat> okay. So what was the failure this time? A bunch of, or well, six of these passed. So I'm getting somewhere. These imports are just being ignored, but that's fine. Um, <clears throat> so. Somehow. All six of those are passing. Get Z1. It's not containing 666. So what's get z1, global get z1. Okay, there's only one place where I'm calling that. What is the global z1? That gets global zero.
and that's coming from spec test. So at some point, yeah, how, how is 666 supposed to get into global I-32? Like, I don't understand where 666 comes from here. <laughs> uh, it looks very much as though these are both expecting to read the value 666 from these spec test globals. But I cannot see. So this does set X and Y, but these are different globals. Is there any global dot set in here? So X and Y get set. Seven and eight get set. So let's just see what happens here. These are all just reads. Z1 and Z2 are supposed to be 666. So um, <laughs> okay. Um, this is surprising. So here is the actual definition of spec test. And it looks like that these It's like when you ask for a global of a specific type, that it just defaults to 666 <laughs> or 666.6 or a vector of four 666s. So that's both odd and mildly unsettling and undocumented. So I suppose I need to replicate this behavior in order to make it work in my program. So how am I gonna do this? Okay, I know how I'm gonna do this. I'm just gonna hard code it. So during that initialization here, I'm going to say if module name, well, let's say K 
case module name in spec test else nil. So let's <laughs> initialize this. Um, if the module name is spec test, then for now, I mean, I it, this actually does depend on the type, but for now, I think to make the test pass, oh, got nil. Oh, I know what it is. It's going to be because of that, isn't it? Yeah, look, I got a lot further. Yeah, and this, this problem is because, like I said, is because it's not parsing strings correctly. Um, but let's add that in. So let's say a default uh, globals imported from spec test to 666. <laughs> um, is there a tag that I can, oh. I suppose it might be this one. Well, in fact, why don't I, I can probably do it for the 1.0, as long as it's here. Yes. In fact, this is a little bit easier to read, isn't it? Um, <clears throat> just because I don't wanna, because I wanna link to a specific line, but I don't want it to then, for that link to rot. Um, if this file moves or if, if lines are added. Um, so let's say, um, although it isn't documented in the interpreter, in the reference interpreter, read me this is going to be one the read me is going to be this uh, maybe I'll use the same one point oh oh this doesn't even mention spec test okay all right um So this one does mention spec test. So maybe I'll just use the same tag for this just for consistency's sake, because I guess this is the most recent one. Although it isn't documented in the reference interpreter readme, the spec test modules exported uh, sorry trying to remember what those globals are called. Um, global I32 and global I64 uh, globals. Um, <clears throat> are initialized to contain the number 666. 
So we need to do the same to make a global dot last pass. And obviously what I should be doing here is creating an instance of a spec test module and sort of registering it with the correct name and have these modules, have these, um, these globals available in it under the correct names, but I don't have any of the machinery for looking them up, for looking up imported globals anyway, so this will do for now. Um, so what's this? Rafik Stern. Now is this just going to be the same kind of situation? Oh, right, so this is actually an assertion, isn't it? So I'm not really sure what these are. What might it be? So, host reference. I mean, I, is the intention here that this is supposed to model like, you know, a, a pointer or, or, you know, some opaque value that only has meaning to, in the Ruby program? Um, and then here I'm just asserting that it's kind of making it out again. Uh Because I don't think this is part of the. It doesn't appear to be part of this. Well, let's say external. External value. Mm, this maybe is talking about something else. Um, so this is expecting yeah I, re I really don't know how to interpret this um, like unsurprisingly it doesn't know how to evaluate this because I haven't told the interpreter how to evaluate this but I don't really know what the meaning of this is But all that this is testing is that you get the same thing back afterwards. Um, and it says here it's a host reference. Yeah, I just don't I just don't understand this well enough at the moment. Um
So let's look in here and see what it says about references. Maybe external types. Uh, I don't know that this is the same thing. Um, so an extern ref, what is this? Oh, this is what I was reading about. The type extern ref denotes the infinite union of all references to objects owned by the embedder and that can be passed into WebAssembly under this type. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I don't yet understand what that means. Um, so, I don't know what this means. Sorry. Values of reference type can be stored in tables. But what do I do with, what can you do with a reference of type extern ref? Uh, okay, well, I okay, clearly I have failed to understand this. I mean, is there is there a test for some of this stuff? Um, no, maybe under ref. Well, ref func ref is null ref null. I mean, I may need to go away and think about what I've done here and try and understand what, because this is, I think this is about the interaction between the WebAssembly runtime and whoever is embedding that runtime. So, you know, a JavaScript interpreter in a web browser, or, you know, in this case, the Ruby program that's, that is running the WebAssembly interpreter. Um, So let's just say, let's just make this evaluate to itself. And then at least it will match. I don't know. Um, maybe I'll make it like extern ref, something like that, some kind of special value. Okay, so that makes global pass. Um, so this is like implement the Is it ref extern? Um, is it even an instruction? Not really. Uh, let's call it a test instruction. Um, I really don't understand what this is supposed to do. So I've just represented it 
with a special symbol for now that's enough to make the global dot west tests pass shrug which reminds me I should do this let's see what happens when I run all the tests I'm expecting I'll still have those other ones pending those pending ones failing on the end but we shall see I mean I think I'm probably gonna stop <laughs> because that has that was quite an ordeal and it's melted my brain a bit um, I've had to make a very large number of compromises in order to make progress on that. So I don't feel great about myself. That was, it was all extremely hacky. Okay, pending test failed successfully. So, okay, yeah, so there's something here that doesn't support import. There's something here that doesn't support import. So we're not, we're currently not parsing import in places where we need to. So that's fine. I can leave that until next time. Yeah, so I'll, um, I'll push this up now. We can hopefully, oh no. Oh no. <laughs> that was very naughty. I shouldn't have pushed that commit. I think I'm going to be punished with a... Well... Maybe I can uh, cancel this one. Yeah. Phew. Wow, I've never done that before. I suppose there's a first time for everything. But yeah, I forgot I, I pushed that without without checking git status first, so that was pretty awful. Why is that run not cancelling? Oh there we go, cancelled. Alright. Alice has already made decent progress, that's good. Cool. Thank goodness my record wasn't sullied by a failing job, although I do now have a this blemish of a cancelled one. We'll now live there forever as a punishment for <laughs> me being so, <clears throat> so careless. <sighs> so, yeah, like I said, um, that was sort of a difficult one. Um, Yeah, it makes me realize that I've I've got some sort of accumulated debt in terms of the fact that I can't just really easily deal with exports and imports. Well, basically, I don't have a nice mechanism for dealing with abbreviations. And up until now, I've been able to just fudge it by... Because the only abbreviations I've had to deal with have been, like I said, sort of local ones where it just gives you a shorter way of writing something that you could have written slightly differently, but in a way that would produce the same thing as you were writing in the first place. But this situation with imports and exports, where in particular with imports, you're basically not writing that thing anymore. You're not writing a global anymore. You're not writing a function anymore you are actually just referring to a different one. 
has made everything a bit more complicated. And the fact that with exports, you know, you can have multiple exports in line as an abbreviation, and you can also have top level exports and this whole issue around needing to synthesize a fresh identifier to tie the export together with the anonymous function is all just like, has hurt my brain a bit. So yeah, this is, I'm glad I got some more test passing. I'm glad I've made some progress. I have done what I said I was going to do, which is try and implement some new features. And I've, I think I've got a better grip on imports and exports than I previously had and on globals than I previously had. Um, but I've also made quite a lot of mess in the process because I needed to just sort of hack those features in and paper over those cracks with like helper functions that understand the nature of the hack. Um, and that's totally fine. I'm prepared to do that for the sake of making progress, but I now feel a little bit uncomfortable about how much debt I've baked into the design there. And so I think I, at some point I am going to need to go back and refine that and and either come up with a really principled way of doing abbreviation. So maybe that means I do like a pre-processor pass that recursively expands all of the abbreviations, even if that does involve synthesizing fresh identifiers and things like that. So sort of a tree to tree transformation where it's like you give me, you give me a, an S expression, maybe, or you give me like a concrete syntax tree and then I expand all the abbreviations and that only then do we then turn that expanded thing into an AST, which feels like it's going to duplicate a lot of knowledge. Or I need to find a way to be able to do all of the, to support all of the abbreviations in line in a single pass as part of the parser without the complexity getting out of control. And I still don't have a very holistic view of how practical that option is going to be because at the moment it feels like doing those, supporting those abbreviations in line is actually causing me quite a lot of hassle. But maybe I just need to refine the way that it's being done and maybe there's, maybe there is a design that allows me to, even though I've started parsing a certain kind of thing, I can maybe produce AST nodes of different kinds in response to whatever is being abbreviated and have it all just coalesce together nicely. But I think I need, well, I needed to get down from the panic of having tests failing and I've done that now. And now I need to probably take a step back and think about my design and see how comfortable I am with those various options. Oh well, a bit, a slightly downbeat ending because I feel like I've been crushed beneath the boot of, of WebAssembly a little bit today, but still I made progress and I, I'm glad of that, even though the sort of Friday the 13th uh, curse has, <laughs> has slightly interrupted um, a streak of sessions where I felt like everything has gone well. Um, this one and certainly it's only gone semi well. But that's all right. Um, I will come back next time and hopefully improve the situation a bit. But for now, I am going to say. <laughs> Why does this button stop working? I'm going to say bye. Um, and as always, I'll just say thanks loads for bothering to watch this. I think this might have been the worst part so far the friday the 13th part um in terms of actually you know i don't think i did a good job of communicating what i was trying to do because i was quite confused about what i was trying to do and none of the none of my solutions were particularly elegant it feels like this this one was a real struggle so thank you for putting up with that i will endeavor to make future sessions a little bit more illuminating um and less of me just sort of thrashing around not knowing what the heck is going on. But um, yeah, I appreciate your patience and your interest in this ridiculous project. So thanks a lot. Um, okay.
I'm going to go. I'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. <laughs>